State Buckeyes and the Minnesota Golden Gophers, where the weather is absolutely fantastic. Temperatures in the 70s and no chance for snow. And let's get rid of this a little bit, Gary. You're a mess. <laughs> well, this has really been home sweet home for Minnesota. Of their two wins this year, both right here at the Metrodome. They won six games last year, five at the Metrodome. And this was also the site of one of the Big Ten's great comebacks in college football history. Ohio State was down 31 nothing at the half, but they roared back. And Greg Fry had Jeff Graham right here for the winning score with just a minute to go. And Ohio State gave John Cooper a 41 to 37 victory and John Gutekunst has told his team all week long we owe Ohio State. Yeah and that's a little bit of a theme and what those themes do is help you focus and for Minnesota to upset Ohio State they've only done it once in the last 22 years they have to focus on blocking those defensive ends two young offensive tackles start starting for them on offense and on defense it comes as simple as this they have to tackle great running backs for Ohio State they must tackle. We also have two coaches on the hot seat John Gutekunst Minnesota he's won just the two games we talked about that and John Cooper despite going six and two he's in trouble as well for John Gutekunst he's done what they've asked him to do he's asked for discipline they've got discipline he asked for good academics he's got nine all Big Ten academic players he has to get a little bit more wins is all he needs and things will be great in Minnesota for Cooper the word is high expectations he came to Ohio State knowing that and when you measure an Ohio State coach you get measured against some of the best Woody Hayes Earl Bruce look at the numbers they measure you by NCAA titles. Woody Hayes with three of them. Earl Bruce, four Big Ten titles. And for Cooper, one more big stat. You have to beat Michigan at Columbus. And if you don't meet beat Michigan at Columbus, you have high anxiety, not just high <laughs> expectations. So we expect a hard-hitting game today. Minnesota against Ohio State. And in our own chilly way, let's go to our own Iceman, a man who deserves to have his name in lights. <laughs> I tell you, if you guys keep putting my name in lights, I will defrost. Hi again, everyone. I'm Tim Brando back in our college football studios. We need to tell you about what we have on the table today. After this ball game, it's the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. The girders are bending now in Jacksonville. Eric Zire obviously will be on display. And so will Shane Matthews in the fun and gun of the Florida Gators. And that will be followed by Clemson and North Carolina. It's not the fun and gun, it's the run and gun with Deshaun Cameron for the Clemson Tigers as they take on the heels tonight at 7.30. Now, let's update some scores. Florida State scoreless against South Carolina. Virginia has just scored again. They are now leading North Carolina State 14 to nothing in the Wolfpack territory. Rutgers and Pitt, it's now 7 to nothing in the first quarter. Van Pelt to Dave Moore for a touchdown. Boston College and Temple, that game now 7-6 in the first quarter. BC looking for their fourth win of the year. Updates all day long coming your way on our ESPN College Football Studios, along with Lee Corso. I am Tim Brando, and Carlos Snow not starting because of last week's concussion, but will be playing. Welcome back to the Metrodome in Minneapolis, where Ohio State meets Minnesota, and the Buckeyes a 14-point favorite. Let's check the Big Ten standings. Michigan continues their march to the Rose Bowl, unbeaten in league play, and hosting Northwestern today. Iowa and Indiana tied for second. They meet in Iowa City later this afternoon. Ohio State and Illinois tied for fourth at three and two. Then it's Northwestern, Purdue, Minnesota, Michigan State, and Wisconsin. And this is the 35th meeting between Minnesota and Ohio State. Buckeyes lead it 28 to 6, including nine straight wins. Well, Minnesota has won the toss, and they will receive, and that is Tim Williams, who will be kicking off. He handles hunting, kickoffs, field goals, extra points, and he does a fine job. And he will be kicking off to number 47, Darren White. it well and white near the goal line takes it at the two and he's down at the 18 yard line and now let's take a look at the energizer starting lineups for Minnesota and there is Markel Fleetwood he is a junior from Decatur Georgia he has thrown for only three touchdowns this year and seven interceptions backs and receivers Antonio Carter moves from fullback to tailback because of injuries James King is a fullback Offensive line, Ron Mertz makes his first career start, replacing Keith Ballard. And Gary, Ohio State's great against the run. What do you expect from Minnesota early? They're going to try to keep Ohio State off balance. Look for draws and screens early in this football game. All right, Fleetwood back to throw and has the screen right away. And it is right through the hands of his fullback, James King. Yeah, be careful right there, too, because it was almost a lateral. 
Now, defensively for Ohio State, they have been excellent. The line anchored by junior Greg Smith, a former walk-on, Alonzo Spellman, can be overpowering. Linebacker Steve Tobar has first team all Big Ten written all over him. He is a Butkus Award candidate. Secondary is young, but they have really developed, and Roger Harper at 6'4", 225, is a strong safety in a linebacker's body. He leads the Buckeyes with three interceptions. On second and ten, flags everywhere. And Minnesota, who has been plagued by turnovers and mistakes all year long, staring in the face of another Pitbull. one. Full start on the offense. You're right. First quarter has been trouble for Minnesota. This time they have a little penalty. You see the left tackle go down in his stance. He moves before the snap. They've had five first quarter turnovers, Minnesota has, in the last two games. You know, they averaged 4.7 yards per rush and pass last week, but when you're way behind early, it doesn't mean much. So they'll be faced with a second and 15. Keswick Joyner and John Lewis come in as wide receivers. And Fleetwood's going with the draw, and this is Carter. And Carter has a whole bunch of uh, meaning for this ball game because he went to Columbus South High School. Yeah, you could see the way he ran that ball right there. He was running north and south. Again, they've run a screen pass. Now they've run a draw pass. And the reason is they've got two young tackles playing this football game, and they don't know if they can handle them up front. Then that means they're going to run draws and screens, and they're going to try to keep this great rushing defense for Ohio State off balance. Paul Hopewell comes into the game at wide receiver. He's off to the left side. He replaces John Lewis. It's third and eight. And Fleetwood play action. He has plenty of time and completes the pass. And that's a first down. It's to his big tight end, Pat Evans. <laughs> what a throw. Evans was fairly well covered on that one. Fleetwood on the bootleg action. Even though it's third down, they're going to try to get Fleetwood away from this big pass rush for Ohio State. There you see him coming out of the pocket, and Evans is going to come right across your screen. And look at fairly well covered right there, and he puts the ball exactly where he had to, and Evans makes a nice catch while he got hit. That fellow is headed towards the East-West Shrine football game. That's how well he has played this year. Fleetwood on the option, and they will pitch it to Carter, and he hits one man, and then is knocked back, and that was Mark Williams at number 99, Alonzo yeah. Spellman. He hit one man, but it felt like two, as big as Alonzo Spellman is. Six foot six, 285 pounds, and I'll tell you, on an option like that, you come down and you run up and run into a guy like that. And it looks like a Buckeye defensive back is injured, and out near the 40-yard line, John Cooper will hut out to find out who it is. And that was the area of concern coming in to this season. Their secondary was very young, and that looks like cornerback Brian Cook. Right, I think it was. And you wonder if from backside, I really didn't get a look at it. I was zeroed in on, on the play and the option play, whether the, the receiver downfield was cutting and throwing on Brian Cook and got his knee taken away. One thing you have to look at, Ohio State has not played a lot of turf games this year, but they do have an indoor facility and have practiced on it all week. Well, they're taking a look at that left knee of Brian Cook, and he is a very physical cornerback on 6'3", 195. Yeah, we really didn't get a look to see if his uh, foot stuck in the turf or somebody, one of the receivers just threw on him. But uh, option football does cause those types of downfield blocks. We have a timeout on the field, no score. 13-37 to play, first quarter between Minnesota and Ohio State. He's down, coach, got time. And there is the injured Brian Cook, and we had a chance to visit with Coach John Cooper, and he said, you know, one thing we've been blessed with this year, particularly on the defensive side, we haven't lost anybody to injury. No, that's right. The same starting lineup that we did earlier in the year against Kentucky, or Louisville, is still starting. Tim Walton will come in to replace Brian Cook. It's second and 11 for Markel Fleetwood. He has come. Cannot escape Steve Tovar, that great inside linebacker, number 58. Well, the screen was set up very nicely right there, and Carter could have caught, cut back and made some yardage right here. This is the game plan. They were a little bit mismatched on the outside with their offensive tackles. There you see Spellman coming in from that side. Now, if Carter cuts inside right there at about the 30-yard line number, he could have set up his blocks and set up maybe a third and five, and that's really what you need if you're Minnesota. Third and five instead of third and ten, the way it is now. Terrific game against Iowa last week. They lost to the Hawkeyes 16-9, though. Rush is on. Fleetwood on low. First down at midfield. Keswick Joyner with the big play catch. 18 yards and a gopher first down. Ohio. 
Ohio State had their nickel coverage in, and it was a beautifully conceived pass with Joyner coming inside the zone and then breaking back outside. You're going to see a protection. What Fleetwood has to do is understand he's not going to have a lot of time. Step up, throw the ball, whether you get an incomplete or not, and that's what he did. He set up, put it into a spot where just Joyner could get it. Good-looking drive early in the game. Lewis Garrison comes in to help out Fleetwood at wide receiver. And Marcus going down the middle. Pat Evans, he's got the first down to the 40-yard line. And Minnesota's offense, they really like to go to their tight end. Well, absolutely. When you're playing a great rushing defensive team, which Ohio State is, the linebackers make the play. Watch the two inside linebackers right in the middle of your screen. Watch how they bite on the play action. And there's the tight end, Evans, going right down. What Fleetwood does is puts the ball on a line to him quickly before the zone could get to him. Nice execution. And Minnesota's on the roll. Fleetwood on the option, pitches out, caught. He's got the sideline. He's got the first down. And he is out of bounds and near the 15-yard line. Chico Nelson maybe making a touchdown saving tackle. More importantly, he's got the ball. He, he fumbled it for a while, and now he has it. Great play on the option. To the market, 15-yard line, gain of 15. You know, Ohio State this year, every time they've won a football game, they've scored on their first possession. Every time the other team has, the Buckeyes and John Cooper have lost. Well, here is Minnesota. Double tight end. Carter. Ooh. Straighten up near the 17, 18 yard line. The man in the middle, Greg Smith, was there. So it was Rich Grimmel. When you start to move the ball against this Buckeye defense in third and short situations, also, they're going to come at you. They're going to move their defensive secondary up. That time, Ohio State gave a little bit of the bear look. They moved their strong safety right up over the tackle. I know Minnesota has a trick play for it. Look for the tight end in this 20 yard area. Gutekunst has never beaten Ohio State. John Cooper has never lost. Fleetwood has his man at the 10-yard line. And we've got time to check in with our man, Tim Brando. Florida State, the number one team in the country in roughly the same position on the field as Minnesota. Casey Weldon to Ampley, and look at the defensive stick by Tony Watkins, the defensive back. They'll have to settle for a field goal by Jerry Thomas, who's been alternating with Dan Mowry of late. 3-0 Seminole. Here in Minneapolis, Tim, we have a scoreless ball game, and Minnesota is facing a third down and a four situation. Here's the option. Cleveland keeps it. He is near the first down. He needed to get to the five-yard line, and I think they'll drop him at the six. Judah Herman was there, who made a career high. 14 tackles in last week's loss to Iowa. Yeah, you wondered if Smith wasn't offside there. He was at least giving away his uh, uh, slant on the play. And it looks like Minnesota is going to take the field goal right here. Here you see Smith goes offsides, and the ball was snapped when he was close to being in the neutral zone. There you see the outside option, the start of it with the tight end. And third and short, and fourth and short, it appears they're going to go for the field goal. Not a greatly popular decision when you're you know, playing a great football team like Ohio State. Well, Ohio State is the best of the Big Ten defensively. They're giving up just 14 points per game. And Schaubert puts it through. Well, Michael Schaubert said, if I get seven field goal attempts, I'll make all seven. That's the way my confidence has been lately. Minnesota has an early 3-0 lead on John Cooper's Buckeyes. Minnesota, who has only scored nine points per game this year, jumps in front of Ohio State. Three nothing on a five minute drive where Markel Fleetwood, our junior quarterback, is five for six. And here is Aaron Peepcorn to kick off the Butler Benote and Dante Lee. And it goes into the end zone, and it'll be Ohio State football at the 20 yard line. And they will start at quarterback. Kent Graham, a 6'5 senior from Wheaton, Illinois. He's thrown for only four touchdowns this year. His backs and receivers, Butler Benote steps in for Carlos Snow, who has a mild concussion but may play. Benote leads the team in rushing with 547 yards. The offensive line averages 285 pounds, and sophomore Alan Klein may be the best they have had since Jim Lachey, the all-pro for the Washington Redskins. And there he is, Carlos Snow. 
King last week after a marvelous performance against Iowa in the first half and then didn't play the second half because the concussion. Edwards goes in motion and they give the football to Benote and Minnesota is right there to wrap him up. Minnesota defensively, the line is banged up, so 6'4", 277-pound Gary Isaacson moves from right tackle to end. Linebackers Joel Stats is a four-year starter on the left side. Marty Mathis replaces Andre Davis inside. Defensive backs, they have been in on too many tackles, which means the offense has had too many big plays. Sean Lumpkin is seventh in the Big Ten with 90 tackles. So there he is, and he is a good one. Set Edwards in motion again after a gain of three. It's second and seven. And Scotty Graham heads up field to the 25-yard line. It'll be third down and five. When John Cooper lost his offensive coordinator, Jim Coletto, who's gone on to Purdue right now, he hired Elliot Uzelak. And there you see him, Elliot, right there calling the plays. And it's been a redefinition of Ohio football, kind of back to basics. They're running the ball. This year so far, they've run the ball 433 times and passed the ball only 140 times. That seems to be a little bit too much weighted in the run to me. And I think Cooper told us he'd like to have it about 60-40. Well, here he faces a third and five. And Graham has his man, Brian Stave line for the first down near the 32-yard line. Boy, that was great execution. Good timing to Stavlin right there. Stave line right there. He pecked it apart with the zone defense. You can see Graham's going to step back. He's reading to his right. He isn't bird-dogging his receiver and delivers it right to the outside of the receiver away from the coverage. Against zones on first down plays, you go just past the first down marker and hook, and that's where the ball was delivered. Ohio State with that balanced attack, but it wasn't balanced last week against Iowa. Right, 34 runs and 32 passes, and that's too much for this Ohio State team. there for Scott Graham and we've got time to check in with Tim. Last weekend we were talking with Casey Weldon the Heisman candidate this time he's passing. He does both well this one to Shannon Baker with a lot of room and a lot of time no old 510 at home. And maybe he needed that week off he has a, a tough one next week what is it Miami and Florida State maybe for the national championship and, and luckily for Florida State I think he passes better than he throws I tell you the guys are outstanding <laughs> football <players. laughs> Joey Galloway comes into the game on second and seven he's at the bottom of your screen and Graham wants to throw plenty of time catches made at midfield and down to the 45 yard line Bernard Edwards and we've got a flag down where the hit was made a gain of 19 by Edwards. You know you have a tough time covering somebody when you interfere with them. Jonathan Mays number nine had a little interference but Edwards came up with the catch. Of course Ohio State will decline it and it was a great execution again. That was an audible by Jeff Graham. Pass interference on the defense. Penalty is declined. First down. I'm sorry, Kent Graham is, is his name. Jeff Graham was the wide receiver a year ago. And Mays came in and hit it, tried to knock the ball away. But that was real heads-up play by Graham. He saw the weak side corner blitz, rolled out away from him, and he knew he had man-on-man -man coverage and delivered it again. Well, Ohio State will refuse the penalty. They'll take that 19-yard gain, and they've got it at the 44 of the Gophers. is hauled down by Dennis Capella and Sean Lumpkin. That's a real a key to this football game. Lumpkin's going to have to get involved in the running game as a safety. And what he's going to have to do is not give it away. He can't let Kent Graham know when he's sneaking up there to make an eight-man front. If Graham's able to read that and audible to one-on-one -on -one coverage, Minnesota's corners are not good enough to play man-to-man -man coverage, so they have to disguise when they're going to that eight-man look. Gary, how do you disguise it? Well, you just got to keep moving around. You can't become static. You can't do the same things over and over again. You have to change up like a good baseball pitcher. Change up your look. Second and seven. On the option, Graham will keep it, and that's just what Minnesota wanted to see. We talked to John Cooper uh, why they have Kent Graham run the option, and he said, Gary, it's real simple. 
We want to keep the defense stretched. We know we can eliminate a lot of coverages when we run the option. And what we're basically trying to do is have Kent Graham come out and pitch the ball. It's basically an option pitch and get the ball around the corner. Yeah, Kent was one of the most highly recruited high school quarterbacks in the nation coming out of Wheaton, Illinois. Went to Notre Dame where he played behind Tony Rice. He's a drop back guy who has always been with an option program. On third and six, he gets the drop back here. And he completes the pass to Stabline, but did he hold on? Caught it. You bet. Stabline held on to it three times. He caught that ball. He rolled over and caught it. Minnesota had a linebacker come absolutely free, but he got caught up in his own men right there. Let's see if we can watch Stabline, how he catches this ball. Graham is looking to his left all the way here. Delivers the ball low. He gets his hands under there. Whoa. Yeah, looks like he caught that thing. It looked initially like it skipped the first time, but he caught it short of the first down, and they're going to have to punt the ball anyway. Well, that career-long 70-yarder came last week against Iowa, and he booms this one, and they will let it go into the end zone. Gophers football at the 20-yard line. Time out on the field, 5-10 to play in the first period. 3-0 Minnesota. Minnesota with an impressive first drive. Here they have it, second possession after taking it 72 yards down the field and kicking a field goal by Michael Chalberg and a 3-0 lead on Minnesota. And Minnesota is watching Ohio State now talk with their offense. Cleveland first down from his own 20. Three wide receivers in the game. And they give it to the running back who has stopped shy of the first down, Antonio Carter. Well, Minnesota's coach John Gutekunst was telling us yesterday, I thought maybe our offensive line got too big in the offseason. Yeah, I asked him, is there anything you'd do differently? And he says, yeah, we've been hit with injuries, and if I'd have to criticize myself, I got talked in a little bit of letting our guys get too big. He says, I don't care how big they get, but from now on, they have to be able to run. And he thinks some of his young guys couldn't carry that extra weight. That's why they've had the series of injuries on the offensive line, especially, which has hurt them. They've got a second and 11 here, and they give it a Carter who muscles forward for about three with the tackles made by number 36, Judah Furman. He wears 36, and what a great number that has been in Buckeye lore with Chris Spielman and Tom Cousineau. Yeah, he had a Spielman-like week last week against Iowa. He had 14 tackles in that football game. When you wear that number, I guess you got something you, you have to you play for each way, week. You know, that last drive Minnesota had, they were five runs and six passes. That's the way they have to keep this Minnesota, the Ohio State defense off balance. They need eight on third down. Fleetwood will scramble, and this is when he's dangerous. Broken up at the 38-yard line to Keswick Joyner. Chico Nelson, excellent coverage. Absolutely great play by Chico Nelson. He timed the ball perfectly and just laid one on him. 190 pounds coming at about 4 or 5 speed right in your back, and you're not going to catch it. Fleetwood did a nice job of avoiding Spellman, who beat inside, made an inside move and got right in his face. So here Dean Kaufman comes out. You know, one thing I've noticed about the Big Ten this year, they have the biggest punter. <laughs> I mean, everybody's like 6'4", 235. Here's Brian Stabline, who will receive, and Kaufman hangs it up. And the sideways bounce, Minnesota will watch it roll inside the 40-yard line, and they'll take it right there. Well, coming up later as a part of our ESPN College Football Triple Header, Georgia is at Florida. That should be a good one. Number 23 of the Bulldogs against Steve Spurrier and Florida. That's at 4 o'clock Eastern time. And later tonight, look at this, that great defensive Clemson. They're the 15th best team in the nation. But they are at North Carolina. Always a tough place to play in Chapel Hill. At 7.30 tonight with Ron Franklin, Mike Gottfried. Steve Fiziak, Gary Danielson with you. Metrodome in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Scotty Graham gets the carry and gets past the 40-yard line and right there to greet him. Dennis Capella, I'm sorry, Butler Benote. Yeah, Butler Benote is obviously in for Carlos Snow. And, and, you know, the two games Ohio State has had trouble and lost, really. Carlos Snow wasn't available to him. He got ding versus uh, Iowa, and he was out versus uh, Illinois. Only played one play, and, and he's been their spark. And Butler Benote has to come through for them today. It's second and eight. 
They throw it to Galloway, and he is stopped behind the line of scrimmage. Derek Fisher. Yeah, it was a play designed for zone coverage, and on that instance, Minnesota had disguised it well and was in man coverage, and it's a play that's just not going to work when you have a corner that's only five yards off the line of scrimmage. Kent Graham has to, Graham has to go up there, see that, and go to a different play because that was a zone-type pass. So this Graham, again, here, faced with another third and long. Yeah, and this is where the situation against Iowa, that they have problems. They were only three for 14 last week in third-down conversions, and they're not going to be great this week if they keep getting third and ten. Well, he'll be staring into the face of a six-defensive back secondary. And he will go down to the 35-yard line. A fumble on the play, but it's picked up by the Buckeyes at the 38-yard line. Dennis Capella, number 51, was the man who really brought down Kent Graham. You got to give this to the defensive secondary. Good coverage. This is not Ohio State's strength. Throwing the ball downfield. Graham sees. Trying to throw, trying to throw. Capella comes up. That's decent coverage right there. That's a decent pass rush, but everybody fit together. Ohio State cannot face third and ten, or they're going to be in trouble in this football game. Tim Williams, first one, went for 38. Lewis Garrison standing at his 25 and backing up. We'll try the middle, and there's not much there. He's out across the 23-yard line where the Gophers will have a first down situation. A minute 39 to play here in the first quarter. Gophers up 3-0. Yeah, you have to believe that John Cooper's a little bit concerned right now. He knows that Carlos Snow has been a, a real spark for his football team. He told us before the game that he expected Butler Bonote to play very well on the turf. He thought he was a turf back and he was going to feature him. He'd like to get through this game without using Snow and be, have him available and healthy for the remaining two games against Indiana and Michigan. That's Brian Cook, who was injured on the second possession. Minnesota's offense and James King the fullback with the catch and a short gain out across the 30 yard line. Yeah I think you're really seeing the game plan unfold for Minnesota. They have not had a back gain 100 yards this year on the ground and they really understand that to gain run against this defense it's only giving up 94 yards a game. They're going to have to keep them off balance. A little bit of option and play action. John Gutekunst has a good game plan going into it. Well, he and Markel Fleetwood have been without two of their best running backs most of this year. Out with injuries, Chuck Rios and Mark Smith. And now we got a broken play. Fleetwood saying, I'm in trouble. But look at this. He escapes for what will be a first down. Derek Foster pushed Markel out of bounds, but... Markell has played this year, John Gutekunst told us, like every game he cannot afford to make a mistake. Yeah, Greg Smith has not been able to be blocked in this game so far. There you see him coming down, number 57. He forces Markell the other way, and just athleticism right here gets it back to the line of scrimmage and a first down. Great play by Fleetwood, but you're right. All the pressure's on Markell, and you can't do that for 60 minutes. It's tough. From the 36. Simmons was right there. They escaped to the 40-yard line, a gain of three by Carter. Let's go to Tim. Take a look at Casey Weldon. Remember that fourth down play against Michigan for a completed pass to keep a drive alive? This one, this one really brings back memories of that. A touchdown pass here to Amp Lee. That made it 17-0. But Bobby Fuller counters for the Gamecocks. He will go long to Eddie Miller. 79 yards, second play of the ensuing drive. Gamecocks still down by 10 against number one in Tallahassee. Remember earlier this year when Lloyd Carr, the defensive coordinator, was telling us about Casey Well and how many times they hit him, oh, and he yeah. popped right back up when he was fun to watch. Fleetwood on second down. Again, he escapes and throws for the first down to John Lewis. Anytime you go on the road and you face a scrambling quarterback, you have to be a little bit worried. Markel Fleetwood right now is making all the plays. He comes out on a bootleg right there. His first receiver's covered. His second receiver's covered. His third receiver was covered. He comes to his fourth man on almost a little bit of a scramble. That's what a great scrambling quarterback can do. And Markel's starting off hot as fire. Jim Huber, the offensive coordinator, is applauding his team. Minnesota with a 3 0 lead, and they are driving again. We'll come back with second quarter action here in Minneapolis.
Minnesota came into this football game a 14 point underdog where they lead three nothing. They scored in their opening possession a Michael Chalberg field goal. And look at that. Gophers 115 yards total offense to Ohio State's 40 and Fleetwood has been magnificent. Yeah the difference in the game so far is Fleetwood has gotten outside of containment and burned them on busted plays. Always a big fear when you're playing a quarterback that just could get hot on you like Markel Fleetwood can. And the other key I think is no turnovers. Minnesota has shot themselves in the foot all year. First and ten at the Ohio State 40 power. The catch at the 40 yard line, a gain of five, and that's his third catch. Let's check in with Tim. Matt Blunden, the baseliner for the Cavalier basketball team, is an outstanding quarterback. Six of six so far against the Wolfpack. Here to Larry Holmes. And the Cavaliers playing like heavyweights against NC State. Here in Minneapolis, Minnesota with a 3 0 lead, second and six. Much there. Boy, their run defense is outstanding. And really, it's that nose man, Greg Smith. Yeah, they, they blocked Greg Smith that time, but he took two blockers with them a little bit, fought it off. And you're going to see Judah Herman, number 36, come into your screen. A little bit of a trap block. Here comes Herman. He hits it and closes the hole real tightly. And that's what the great linebackers do. Come up and funnel that hole where there's nowhere to run. And, and look at Greg Smith. I mean, he had to fight off like two, oh, yeah. even a third blocker. It's no fun playing nose tag. <laughs> and then Herman gets the glory. <laughs> We talk about Herman, right? <laughs> it's third and four. He's in trouble. And Simmons has him. Jason Simmons with his seventh sack this year. Getting a third and four situation. Ohio State goes with a nickel. And at the top of your screen, Alonzo Spellman is going to beat Pat O'Brien, number 77. Just a redshirt freshman. He's got his hands full with Spellman. Problem is, he didn't have enough of his hands full. You got to hold a guy like that because Alonzo Spellman's going to be a pass rusher in the NFL. Dean Kaufman. Brian Stabline is deep for Ohio State, standing at his 10. Good job, defense. Kaufman going to the sideline. Stabline will let it go, and Ohio State will have it at the 18-yard line. And we've got a commercial break with 13.03 remaining first half. John Cooper's team down by three. We thought earlier that was a gopher. But that was a squirrel out there in Minneapolis, even in the wintertime. This city guy couldn't tell him apart. I don't know about you. I he, rely on you on that one. He had your pregame notes. <laughs> it's first and ten for Ken Graham, and he goes to Butler Benote's short game. You know, every week in the Big Ten, we go on campus to find out who will be our student sideline reporter, and this week's winner is a senior in economics, Randy Kish, who has a report on the injured Brian Cook. Brian was injured on Minnesota's first possession. He's got ice on his knee right now. He's got a sprained left knee, and he's gone for the rest of the game. All right, thanks, Randy. We'll be checking back with you throughout this contest. So Cook is out. Walt will be the defensive back again when Ohio State is on that side of the football. Second eight. Graham did not like the defensive look and then looked at the clock and it was winding down so he calls timeout. Minnesota with a 3-0 lead with 12 minutes and 20 seconds to play in the first half. John Cooper's Buckeyes trail by three. It's second down and eight. Ken Graham and tight end Cedric Saunders both went to the sideline on that last timeout. They give it to Benote. He's around the right side. Not much there. No gain. It's third and eight. Minnesota's corners are right up on the line of scrimmage. They're playing zone defense, and the first thing they're doing is looking in the backfield and getting up there. That time, Mays, when you try to run a sweep wide, he's looking in there. That's why they play the zone, and they, that was a counter tray type action. And Benote slips a lot. You know, he, they thought it was a lot on the grass. They thought he'd do a better job on the turf. But it does not seem to be that he's uh, got his feet wide enough apart, you know, and seems to be a sprinter. He's going to have to make a little wider base. Like Carlos Snow. Right, like Carlos Snow. Third and eight. Graham unloads. Cook 
completes the pass first down past the 40 yard line is Bernard Edwards. Well, everything we've seen of Kent Graham has been right on the money throwing the football. They don't ask him to throw a lot of passes, and that's very difficult. This is a basic zone cut right now. One guy goes out, one guy goes down the middle, and the curl right in the zone, delivered right at the numbers perfectly. And I think if Kent Graham was allowed to throw the ball maybe just four or five times more a game, he would be more comfortable to play against an Indiana and a Michigan, which he's going to have to do. There you see it. He's perfect today, and he goes to Benote. It was a nice hole past the 45, and then he is pushed back. I think you know, that I think Lumpkin got on that play the strong safety, and I think Minnesota's saying if you're going to beat us today, you're going to beat us throwing the football. We're going to concentrate a lot of guys near the line of scrimmage. We're going to sneak our strong safety up there, Lumpkin, to stop the running game and see if you can do it. Can you drive it all the way down the field without throwing the football? We don't think so. Sean had that big game last year against Ohio State when he intercepted a pass and returned it 75 yards for a touchdown. We've got a second and four after a gain of six by Butler Benote. Again, Benote. And again, barely back to the line of scrimmage. Joel Stats brought him down number 55, that left outside linebacker. State line that time almost clipped the cornerback that time from the outside coming in and Mays wasn't able to help out stats was there but it appeared to me again Benote wasn't able to cut up and make the move that his feet goes out from under you know one thing I do notice he's got a lot of tape on his shoes right there and I wonder if he has enough traction and it appears that he just has gym shoes on too no no spikes scrambles forward and his lean may have gotten him the first down he needed to get just across the 48 yard line in Minnesota territory. Grinnell Mays brought him down. Yeah I think that's what Butler Benote is going to have to do better and better is run north and south like Carlos Snow has learned to do it and take it up in their spin slash through some runners and get those first downs when Ohio State has that third and four or five yards they're tough they're going to convert a lot of first downs and I think he's got this one. Yeah coach Cooper said I really think Butler Benote is going to have a terrific game today. Maybe he has to go change his shoes. Put on the Minnesota Twins cleats. <laughs> Needs a little bit more room. Oh, interesting here. 50-yard line, fourth and less than a yard. I, I got to believe Ohio State will go for it right here. This is against a defense that gives up 27 points per game and also over 430 yards. That was Bernard Edwards there, the six foot five receiver. Is he a stud or something? He's the first one off the bus. When the receivers go off the bus first, you're, you got to feel good about your chances. Well, on fourth and inches, they'll bring in the two tight ends. That means Jeff Ellis and Cedric Saunders. Graham sneaks it, and he has it. Remember, Kent Graham goes six foot five, about 215 pounds too. So that looked pretty good, right up there. And this is the type of drive that Ohio State likes to do, and I really believe Minnesota wants Ohio State to do. They want to keep them making first down slowly, stop them, and look for a turnover, look for a hold, and get them into a passing situation where they feel confident. Ohio State. They like to run the football on first down. See what they do here. 47 of Minnesota. They'll throw it for the first time. And Graham completes the pass to Stabline, who escapes left sideline inside the 20. You really can't execute any better than that right there. That ball was thrown before Stabline turned around. It was thrown to his outside shoulder because the defender was inside a little bit on the curl. That's how you get 28 yards. A little bit after the play action right here. You see him read the coverage first. He sets up. And watch where the ball is thrown away from the coverage to the outside shoulder. And that's what the great quarterbacks can do. Deliver that ball away from the coverage. And then the receiver knows which way to turn and gain more yardage after the catch. Minnesota using a new free safety today. Ken Seabree replaces Andre Thaddeus. And now look at the red zone for Ohio State. 19 touchdowns in the 27 teams have been down there. Option. Graham to keep it. Inside the 
the 15-yard line. <laughs> well, I tell you, when Graham fakes the pitch, you know something's up his sleeve right there because that is not going to happen a lot. Ken Graham says, I can run the option. You know what? I used to say that, too. You know, you're going to run the option in the offense. you got to convince the coach you can do it. From the outside, he's got, I think it's that, he's right in his face, or is it stats? Right in his face. He makes the pitch, and then he comes inside to gain positive yards. And that's a positive play near the, near the line of scrimmage and in the plus area. Game of three, second and seven. But no tag. Gain of 12 and another Ohio State first down, so they'll have a first and goal. Yeah, that's the Butler Banote that Elliot Uslak told us about and why he's going to be such a great back. He had forward lean. He saw a little crack, and he just took it, running his 4-3 speed. He's fastest on the team and did not look for to, to beat anybody or have any miss. He just took it north-south and creased it in there. So he now has 31 yards. His best game, 189 yards in the opener against Arizona, and that's the most since Keith Byers had 274 against Illinois way back in 1984. And they slam forward. And there's the touchdown for Ohio State. Well, that was pretty easy. From the 20-yard line in, those are 17 tough yards. I think it was first and 10 on the 17. Scotty Graham's going to get it with a little slant play to the strong side. And they just powered the Minnesota defense on their heels right into the end zone on all, really, all three of those plays. Here you see it. Plankers to that side, the running backs to that side. Graham gets the ball. Bang. Look, his head's almost in the end zone before he gets any, really anybody to hit him, and he falls forward. And on a goal line, when you can fall forward, you've got some good blocking up front. Tim Williams for the point after. It is straight through. And Ohio State with their first lead of the game at 7-3 on a Scott Graham touchdown. His fifth of the season, 8-0-2 remaining. First half, 7-3, Ohio State. Ohio State with a 7-3 lead now on Minnesota. We're in the second quarter in an old Woody Hayes drive. It took them 11 plays. They take it 82 yards. They take five minutes off the clock. And Scotty Graham with his fifth touchdown of the year. Buckeyes yeah. first lead of the game. Old Woody Hayes drive spiced in with Kent Graham throwing. I think he made two perfect throws on that drive. And that really opened up the running game, I thought. Well, Williams will be kicking off. Darren White, lone return man. At the five, he'll take it at the eight. Oh, and he fumbles the football. And the Buckeyes say they have it, and the referees say they do as well. During commercial break, I was just telling you, it's imperative that Minnesota does not go three and out right now. It's going to be deflating to that Minnesota defense. So what do they do? They go none and out. A turnover really kills this play. Looked like he was in the open, had some space to run. But a ball, it, I think the helmet goes right at, no, from around the backside. I think it was Chico Nelson that really made the play. Strapped around, and now you're looking at the ball at the 24-yard line again, and the tired, pounded defense that just had a long drive is back out of the John Gutegaard saw this happen at Michigan, remember, when they turned it over in the first quarter, and all of a sudden Ohio State went up. 21 nothing. They've given the ball away 20 times. They've taken away just 14. They are last in the Big Ten. And Graham is going to give it right up the middle. And let's go to Tim. Fellas, I'm going to show you a 14-point swing. First for Rutgers, Tom Tarver at quarterback. He will hit Lance Avena. Now watch him get hit by Pitts Lex Perkins. He fumbles the football. Tinker Harris comes away with it on the ensuing drive. Alex Van Pelt off the play fake will bootleg it in. And Pitt is leading by seven. You may have a 14-point swing coming in your game, gentlemen. I thought they had the fleet flicker to the wrong team. <laughs> 7-3 Ohio State on a second down. Carlos Snow's in the game, and he's got the first down. Snow and Jeff Cothran's in the game, too. 
The great fullback comes up there and laid a good block on the outside. I think you can see what Ohio State wants to do. Pass to the wide end and have isolation football to the tight side. Carlos Snow might be the second best back in the Big Ten right now. Vaughn Dunbar, Carlos Snow, Ricky Powers. you got to mention those three guys in the same sentence. Well, he is third on Ohio State's all-time rushing list. Actually fourth behind Archie Griffin, Tim Spencer, and Keith Byers. First and ten. Grand keeper inside the ten. And he's here another first down. Well, John Cooper has come under some uh, criticism for running the option. You got a six foot five quarterback that doesn't look like an option quarterback. Why are you running the option? The guys on the phone are always saying in those call in shows. He says, Gary, I know why I'm running the option. There's a reason for it. It keeps defenses out of a lot of different coverages. You don't blitz as much. It makes our running game go. All he has to do is pitch the ball. And our defenses having to work on that all week in practice. You, you spread them. You have to spend time working on a defense. Good point. Second and one. So they give it a Conklin as he hit at the line of scrimmage. I think it was Dennis Capello again, number 51. Kind of an undersized tackle. He only weighs about 225 pounds. But they pinched in and made the play. We are at the Metrodome in Minneapolis, Minnesota. 6-12 to play in the first half. And it's 7-3 Ohio State. And we've got a timeout on the field called by the Buckeyes. And John Cooper will talk things over on a third and short situation. Carlos Snow still healthy. And John Gutekunst worried. Big challenge for Minnesota. They are faced with a third and two situation by the Ohio State Buckeyes after the turnover on the kickoff. Yeah, everybody points the plays at the end of the game as the turning point. Right here could be a turning point in this football game. Minnesota's defense has to come through and force Ohio State into a field goal here. It could get ugly. Carlos Snow to the goal line. Man, does he hit that line of scrimmage right now? He is running a sprint when he gets that football, and he's got great vision, too. I mean, that was a cutback. That is not where that play was designed. You can see the alignment. That was going to be to the left. That was where it was designed. He cut back, found a crease, and just a north-south runner. He's not very tall. Then he bends down. How'd you like to tackle that guy? How about this uh, defensive stop? As you see Snow's stats. He has been beaten up most of this year. That hip problem, the concussion problem. Yeah. Now they've got a first and goal at the one-inch line. Yeah, I don't see you think you'll see option football like they had the fumble against Illinois early. They're going to power it into the end zone. Snow. Touchdown. I tell you, Carlos Snow has really improved since when we saw him earlier in the year. He is a force in this Big Ten right now. Lenny Hartman, number 52, is going to pull around and come across your screen. And he's got Collins man-on-man. Man, and that just allows Snow to get to the outside and get it right into the pylon for 14 points if they make the extra point. I had a chance to watch him at Cape High School in Cincinnati when he scored 108 touchdowns in four years there and was the best running back in the country. Wanted to be a Buckeye. Well, here we go. Tim Williams to try and make it 14-3. to three. And he does, but a flag will fly right at that line of scrimmage. Yeah, I think uh, Ken Seabury jumped off that time. Of course, they'll decline it and go and take the point. Well, the one thing John Gutekunst said, we cannot put the ball on the carpet like we have lately, and they did it after the kickoff and a short 24-yard drive here. On the defense, we'll be penalized on the kickoff. The point is good. And another penalty. You know, there really is a reason why Minnesota has gone in five Big Ten football games, and they've had in four of them less than eight or less points. They're shooting themselves in the foot all the time. They've got a nice quarterback. They can move the ball around. But these turnovers, and I think what John has told us, is on forced errors has really been killing this football team. They've had some injuries. You know, they have a little bit of an immaturity. They've graduated some people. But they're making the mistakes on sometimes being on forced. On a kickoff, you got to hold the ball. You know you're going to get hit by six, seven, eight guys. You just can't turn it over on the 20-yard line. Your team is not that good. 
Gopher fans trying to fire up their team. And you may have seen those Big Ten scores. Michigan leading Northwestern 21 to 7. We understand Desmond Howard has scored his 20th touchdown this year. He's only got one? Just one. Well, they're so bottled, far. They're bottled they're bottled in the quarter. 21 yeah. nothing. Huh? 21 7 now with Northwestern oh. scored in the uh, last time. What do you got? A monitor over there watching the. Well, Michigan they had it up there. Oh. Brando sent it to us. <laughs> That's right. All right, Williams will kick off from the 40 yard line after the five yard penalty. And John Lewis is now deep. And I wonder why Lewis is out there. Yeah. Rather than the uh, other fella who fumbled the ball his last time. Darren White. Take a knee. Ben. Take it at the 20. And Minnesota will with five and a half minutes remaining in the first half. Ohio State just had to go 24 yards on their last touchdown drive. Kept by that man, Carlos Snow, on a one-yard run. And for Carlos, that was his sixth touchdown this season. Well, Minnesota's going up against a good football team. This is a great defense. You see Elliot Uzelak right there? Let's listen to him when he's saying. Okay. This guy will hang right here. We can bleed yards on the trap. Keep going on. Now I'm 47. On first down, Markel Fleetwood just unloads it out of bounds. Tim Brando, what do you have for us? Texas Tech has beaten Arkansas 15 out of 16 times in the series at Lubbock. And here is Blackshear with a touchdown reception from the arm of Robert Hall. It's 10-0 Texas Tech. And Arkansas is leaving the Southwest Conference. It seems like every team they meet is a little angry with them about just that. It'll be second and ten for Minnesota. And now we've got to talk about one, two, three, and out because that Minnesota defense has been on the field a long time, second quarter. Absolutely. They've got to get a couple first downs or at least put something up to punt the ball on the other side of the field. Fleetwood with pressure, and it's almost picked off by Chico Nelson. He was looking for Keswick Joyner, and now Markel faces third down and very long. Yeah, Keswick Joyner is limping a little bit as he comes across right there. If that was a well-thrown ball, it would have been intercepted. Chico Nelson right there coming across. Seems like he got his leg hit as he was jumping for that ball. Well, coming up at halftime, we'll be in with Tim and Lee Corso as they bring us up to date on some of the top 25 scores and highlights like South Carolina and number one Florida State. Casey Weldon, we understand, has already thrown for a couple of touchdowns. And Virginia right now smashing North Carolina State. What's happened there? Also a preview of number 23 Georgia against number six Florida. Third and ten. Blitz is on. Down goes Fleetwood. Inside the 15-yard line, and there's a flag. And it was a late one. Yeah, I, I really don't know what the call was, but I'll tell you, it was, a, it, it was a breakout for a pass rush that time. Any one of three people could have had the sack. They were racing each other to get that stat that time. Boy, that, that's bad news when you have a holding penalty and three guys almost make a sack. Minnesota cannot get in third and ten. They're just not good enough to block this great rushing team that Ohio State has. There you see, they call this a breakout. Three guys are going to come through. Spellman could make the play. Kaczurski could make the play. Rodgers was the one who was holding, I think, on Spellman. See if it wasn't Rodgers right there. Robert Rodgers tried to hold, and he still gave up a sack. Ohio State is going to get the ball inside the 50-yard line again. Very tough on your defense. Well, Fleetwood, he's now saying, uh-oh, I'm well-rested. Yeah. My defense is not. And Kaufman. You know, and Ohio State has adjusted. They know now that they're going to try to run bootlegs and get outside on first and second down, and they've taken that away from them. It's a constant chess game between the two coordinators, and I don't believe that Minnesota's offensive line is going to be able to handle this defense for Ohio State. State showing like they want to block it. And Kaufman sends it a state line who will have it inside the 40 yard line. Hey, inside the 40. State line's inside the 25. 23 yard punt return, and Minnesota's getting no help. State line came up read the play made the catch on the run and there's a missed tackle that's the key right there on about the 40 yard line and that got an extra that's like a first down play gain in an extra 25 yards and now your defense is on the field again with the 20 yard line backed up and here and here comes carlos snow 
Cowboys stayed line's longest return of the year. Chip Cothran, the fullback, number eight. Snow, the eye back, number 25. Graham will keep it. 15 yard line, he dives to the 12. And here's a guy who is averaging like minus three yards per carry, and obviously that's with sacks, but. Yeah, I think John Cooper's game plan is working out right here. You can see Minnesota wants to take away the pitch. That means they probably spent 35 to 40 percent of their practice time all week working on the option and what the assignments were and not enough time stopping the power attack that Ohio State's going to throw at them. Gain of eight, second and two. Snow, first down. He's inside the five-yard line. Well, Cawthon is just pushing around people. The fullback is doing such a great job. This time he blocked number 91, Russ Heath. Snows five yards into the secondary before anybody's even laying a hand on him. Well, there's Jeff Cawthon, Prop 42 casualty last year. He's from Middletown, Ohio. And he had that terrific game against Arizona earlier this year when he carried the ball seven times for 105 yards and scored a touchdown. And they were just praising the work of this fella. And then he got kind of dinged up with that knee. And he's just really getting back to full speed. They've got four great running backs here that they can almost interchange. Scotty Graham also just as good of a blocking fullback, too. They always keep him fresh. Here we go. First and goal. hear Kent Graham that time dummy and audible basically he pretended he was calling an audible white 99 and they handed off to the fullback very few audibles where you just hand off to the fullback this is off the option that they've been running this time he hands it off to the fullback and look at Cawthon run through Mathis I believe it was right into the uh, right into the uh, secondary and get the first and get the touchdown. Dave Mono with a good block, number 77, who started today in place of Rod Smith. Williams for the point after. And Ohio State now leads it 21 to 3 over Minnesota. The offense for Ohio State really is fitting well together nicely, but it's easy to call offensive plays when you're manhandling the defense, and that's really what's been handled so far. You've got a 24-yard drive, a 19-yard drive, and here we have a look at what ESPN will bring your way on this college football Saturday. Number 23, Georgia against number 6, Florida at 4 o'clock. Then at 7, the college football scoreboard show highlights scores from around the country. 7.30, we've got Clemson against North Carolina. That's at Chapel Hill. That would be a good one. And the residents in college football scoreboard to bring you up to date on what happened throughout the day. At halftime, we'll be going to Tim and Lee. And they will have always those articulate thoughts on what happened in our game and uh, throughout the day. Florida State is playing the number one team in the nation. Minnesota Golden Gophers, their first possession, they go 81 yards. Their last three, it has been one, two, three, and basically out. And sprinkle in a fumble also in there and a, and a punt where they miss a tackle down to the 20-yard line. So it does not bode well for the Gophers. I don't think they can play catch up to the extent they're going to have to drop it back and pass because they just don't have the protection with the injuries on the offensive line. speed heads to the sideline and Mark L. Fleetwood will take over after a 31 yard return and Fleetwood who has had a fine day will come to the line of scrimmage to the 32 yard line I mean he's completed over 75 percent of his passes but of lately of late that Ohio State defense has strengthened themselves. Streaking right through, or rather, James King and King is all the way to the 20 yard line before he's hauled down from behind by Foster Paul. When we did the Minnesota game earlier, we did not see James King. He didn't even make the trip injured. But this time, off the trap option, they're going to hand it to the fullback. 
There they fit with the trap on Permel, and that breaks James King into the secondary. But he does a nice job right here is switching the ball to the outside hand as he sees Pulp come and gets as much as he can out of the uh, out of the play. And that's really what they had to have is turn the field upside down and get into some scoring territory and not punt black backed up again. King's 55-yard run, a career best, has the football at the 13-yard line of Ohio State. And McClintock comes in with Antonio Carter. And Cleveland wants to throw in the end zone. Way yeah, that was one of those. Kirby Puckett would have had to catch yeah. that one off the glass that time. <laughs> That one banged away, but that's what you have to do on first down. They expected a blitz from Ohio State. They got fooled a little bit, so he just tossed it away. 91 yards passing on the afternoon, and that last run, 55 yards by King, was the longest play from scrimmage by Minnesota this year. So they'll be faced with a second and 10 situation, and they want to come out at least with three. Omar Douglas. In the game of wide receiver. Fleetwood trying to go in the opposite. And Ohio State really strings it out, no game. Yeah, that, that's exactly what they did. String it out, and they've got great speed from the backside. Jason Simmons making the play, Mark Williams making the play, number 51, just running down. You know, how do you feel sometimes when you're running an option and you know the guys on the other side, defense, they got seven guys faster than you. And the longer they string it out, you know they're catching up every time you take a step. And this is a young defense. They only have two seniors, so I think they're nice now. Yeah, they're they are playing, the best in the Big Ten. Playing great defense as a unit. Third and nine. Scrimmage. Well, he wanted to go to Lewis Garrison. It was cutting over the middle, but strong coverage from the safety. And they also had Tom Lease, a linebacker, who was releasing and uh, dropping in that zone. Yeah, Tom Lease made the play, but he wanted to throw the slant off the play action. It wasn't there. He pumped. Now it's too late. You can't throw it. 12 guys almost can make a play on that, and they only got 11 on the field. When you try to throw a slant that late, you're in trouble throwing it over the middle of the field. And this is the status of the game so far. In the second quarter, they're already forced to go. Fourth and nine, and they're going for it. Join in motion. Carter on the sweep, and look at this. Jason Simmons. That one's a little surprising right there. You can understand going for it fourth and nine, but a, a sweep, even if it works well, is hard to pick up nine yards against Ohio State. You see it, they go two tight ends. Run the sweep to the outside. You got people that gets bounced off, but Jason Williams comes up, forces it outside, and they lose yardage. Tough play. Started off so well with the big one to Jimmy King, and they get nothing out of it. Look at this, Minnesota. They have scored eight or less points in four of their five Big Ten games this year. I mean, the most they scored was the 26 in their opener, a six-point win over San Jose State. State is up by 18 with 2.27 left first half and just flying through the middle goes Carlos Snow. This is almost becoming a sparring session for Ohio State getting ready for their last two games right now. He didn't want to use Carlos Snow. He's just getting them ready. He wants to get them some work pointing for Indiana and Michigan in front of them and Ohio State looks very impressive. This is a much better football team than we saw earlier in the year. You see South Carolina was hanging with Florida State 17 to 10. We will have highlights of that on our halftime show with Tim Brandon and Lee Corso. Snow. Oh, man. He gets slugged around. He's like a little pinball. Yeah, he's, he's like a pinball that weighs 215 pounds. That's the only problem right there. Now, here's a guy that, that had a tough start at Ohio State. He came in, he had fumbling problems. You know, when he first entered, he had the surgeries, two knees and a hip surgery to miss 1990. He comes back and he has to work his way back with a guy named Robert Smith in front of him, puts in all that time, and look who's the featured back now, Carlos Snow. You've got to give him a lot of credit. And there are some around Columbus who will tell you that Robert Smith may not have even started anyway that Pinote and uh, Snow had come back so well. False start on the offense, still first down. And had overtaken the Big Ten's freshman of the year, Robert Smith, who was so outstanding last year. Well, uh, uh, Robert Smith is a good football player, no and I don't, don't want to uh, 
take anything away from him and the ability he has, but I don't think running backs was Ohio State's problem going into this year. <laughs> now with Graham, Cothran, Snow, Benote, Raymond Harris. And they moved Dante Lee over. He was a running back also. Snow in the defensive backfield has the first down pass. The 47-yard line where Andre Thaddeus makes the tackle. Well, I tell you, he's playing at a different gear than everyone else in this football game. Isolation play right here. Scotty Graham gets a good, a good block. There he is, burst into the field. And look at his forward lean right there all the time. If he's going to fall, he's falling forward. All the great backs do it. And again, you have to give credit to that offensive line that has really improved. Andy Allen Klein, number 67, Lenny Hartman, a very young line. They'll all return next year for three sophomores. He's averaging over seven yards per carry in this game. Play action. Ground downfield. It's almost intercepted. Grenon Mays had it in his hands, and once again, Minnesota cannot come up with the big play. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what John Gutekunst told us. Is every game, when a play needs to be made, they can't do it. Mays is covering the wide receiver to the outside, but he reads the quarterback. He's supposed to go deep with the wide receiver, but he sees the ball thrown and falls back on the overthrown ball. That should be an interception. You know, and I've said it before, man, I'll say it again, though. Thank God the defensive backs can't catch because those 30 interceptions that I had at Purdue would have been something like 50. Yeah, but you beat Minnesota that one three, one year, and, and what was your uh, completion percentage? I had a good day that day. We, I, only was, I only missed three passes that day. I had over three. <laughs> <laughs> only threw three. But you were such a field general. <laughs> Carlos Snow. Who has over 50 yards rushing already in this contest will give Ohio State a third down with a minute 15 and counting. Joey Galloway will go wide right for John Cooper. Bernard Edwards in the slot and the officials take time out. Just stopping the play. You know, one thing about Kent Graham, I remember John Cooper saying earlier this year, you know, we just want him to stay on the fairway. We don't want any triple bogeys. Sometimes you need a, an eagle, yeah. a birdie to beat the Michigans and Iowa's of the world. But he has opened it up today, and Kent Graham has the first down on a beautiful run to the 35. Kent Graham running the option right there. That's the fun way to run the option. You come out, and there's nobody even to look at. Somebody takes away the pitch right here. You give a phantom ball fake, you run the ball right here, you'll see it to the outside, makes a phantom ball fake, and he turns up field, and he already has seven rushes for 31 yards in this football game, keeping him off balance with the game plan so far. 55 seconds left first half. This time they pitch it, there goes Snow. He's to the 25, and he knocks another man down. Again, great execution on the option. This time, Joel Stats, number 55, is going to take Graham away. You'll see it fake to the fullback. Here he comes. Here comes number 55. Boom. Get rid of it. You're going to get hit. Get it to your running back. Turns up, and there's that forward lead again that Carlos Snow is so impressively doing in this football game. Nine carries for 70 yards. Graham has him to the 22. We've got Tim and Lee coming up at halftime. Graham down throws Joey Galloway would streak past Grenon Mays. And they tried to stick it in there between the zone. It's a it's a pass that he completed late in the game against Illinois to try to, to get their only seven points. He tried to stick it in there and he overthrew it. He kind of threw it right into the ground. So far in this game, Ohio State's play selection, 31 runs and eight passes. That's about standard for them in the game. And that fella has completed seven of those passes. Completion was the drop intercepted by Drew. Ohio Mayer. State is going to have to take a timeout. There's only nine seconds to go on the play clock right now. Six seconds, five. Timeout. Now, why doesn't he do that a little earlier? Well, there's really well, there's 27 seconds. The, the clock was stopped anyway yeah. after the incomplete pass. He wanted to see what happened. There was a little bit of mix up in personnel, but it really didn't make any difference. It's towards the end of the half. The only problem now is that was their last timeout. Next week, we've got a great triple header. Check this out. Indiana, the number 25 team in the nation with Vaughn Dunbar going against Ohio State. That game will be in Columbus next Saturday, 1230 Eastern time. Both those teams headed for bowls. Arkansas against Texas A&M, and they are 12th rated, and that will be our primetime showcase CFA football and our primetime game, the battle for the WAC championship. Brigham Young. Scotty. 
has not lost after losing their first three. They're six and zero in league play, and San Diego State has just one loss in the WAC conference. So they will try, and that may be to find out who goes to the Holiday Bowl, a game you can watch here on ESPN. Right here, 27 seconds to go. Ohio State is going to have to throw the ball, not in the playing field. If they want to throw it, they need to throw it where they get out of bounds or in the end zone. They're not going to have time to line up and run two plays. Second and ten. Edwards State line to the top of your screen. Option. Graham keeps it. He's to the 15. He's going to have to throw the ball down. See, I don't understand why the field goal team has to come in. He could get up and just snap the ball. That was a break for Ohio State. The referee stopped the play right there. Lost after losing their first three. They're six and zero in league play, and San Diego State has just one loss in the WAC conference. So they will try, and that may be to find out who goes to the Holiday Bowl, a game you can watch here on ESPN. Right here, 27 seconds to go. Ohio State is going to have to throw the ball, not in the playing field. If they want to throw it, they need to throw it where they get out of bounds or in the end zone. They're not going to have time to line up and run two plays. Second and ten. Edwards State line to the top of your screen. Option. Graham keeps it. He's to the 15. He's going to have to throw the ball down. See, I don't understand why the field goal team has to come in. He could get up and just snap the ball. That was a break for Ohio State. The referee stopped the play right there. 32 yards out from Tim Williams. And he hits it, and it looks to be a little wide, and it is. Yeah, see, that was that they rushed everything so much right there. I think the better play that time is after the option play, get up, take the snap from center, ground it right away, real st that stops the clock and, the, the clock, and then you can walk out there and kick a leisure field goal. There's no reason to run your green out, especially when you kick the ball on less than fourth down. I think I think the strategy there was not great strategy. I don't mind the option play, but there was time for the quarterback to get up under the center and just ground the ball to stop the clock. The sophomore Tim Williams visiting with his coach, John Cooper, and apparently. That's like playing in a foursome. John Cooper saying you took your eye off the ball, right? You know, you hit one out of bounds finally, and then all three of your partners come up to you and say, well, you know, you took your, you lifted your head, you followed through too much. It looked like you like... rushed your follow through. And he was <laughs> rushing because usually in golf, you don't have that. Well, not usually. You don't have that clock on you. Fleetwood with three seconds left gets it to Carter. And Antonio just hits a field. He is near midfield and then pulled down. So a nice game to end the half as Carter goes for 26 yards, but Minnesota finds themselves down by 18 points as the Buckeyes roll in the second quarter. We welcome you back to our college football studios. I am Tim Brando, along with the coach, Lee Corso. Ohio State rolling now against Minnesota is 21-3. Remember, Carlos Snow did not start this game because of a concussion last week. It is my opinion that this game changed as soon as he came in. You're right, but it changed a little bit sooner than that. Let me tell you, as Gary Danielson said, and he was absolutely right, that turnover on the kickoff return took the heart out of Minnesota. You add that to Snow, the way the Ohio State offense looks. But you know what it brings me up? Iowa kept these guys to nine yeah. points last week. They must be a great defensive tells team. You, tells you how good Hayden's Hawkeyes really are. Speaking of good, Casey Weldon, 10 of 15 with one interception for 70 yards and two touchdowns in the game against South Carolina. The game is now at intermission. Let's update you on how the score got to 17-10. The original Tomahawk chop, Chief Osceola doing the number. First quarter, 3-0 FSU. And watch Terrell Buckley pick it off. His ninth pick of the year. It was 10-0 Florida State. And then in the second quarter, watch Casey Weldon. He did this against Michigan to keep a drive alive. This one for a touchdown to Amp Lee. 17-0, his 20th TD pass of the year. Weldon, very sharp as we mentioned, and the Gamecocks of Sparky Woods hanging tough though, 17-10 in the week before showdown Saturday. Michigan and Northwestern, Desmond Howard, a 64-yard touchdown run, two receptions, 87 yards. His 20th touchdown this season to break Tom Harmon's record set in 1940. 
Notre Dame with the help of some Tennessee turnovers on the opening kickoff. And oh, by the way, in a big game, Andy Kelly picked off an interception return. Tom Carter, a 79-yard interception return. Penn State and Maryland. The Nittany Lions 32-1-1 in this series. Saka to Kyle Brady in the game. Tony Saka making it 14-0 Penn State. Virginia taking on NC State in the ACC. A windy and cold day at Carter Finley. And Matt Blondin, the baseliner from Hoops, finds Tyrone Davis. Look at him go. He will high step, and then he will low step, and he will go down at the one. That would lead to a three-yard run by Terry Kirby, making it seven to nothing. Blunden now will hit a wide-open Larry Holmes. Another heavyweight pass from Blunden. It's 21-3 Virginia. Blunden has not thrown an interception this year, and they are rolling right now with seven bowl representatives on hand to take a look at Matt Blunden. Last year, we were talking about Sean yeah. Moore to Herman Moore. Now we're not talking about them anymore. No more, because Matt Blunden is 8 out of 10, over 190 yards, and two touchdowns in the first half. 6-7, great pro prospect. They won six in a row, Virginia has. This will make it seven. I think they're January 1st ESPN Peach Bowl bound. All right. Could be against East Carolina if they keep rolling and go 10 and 1 the rest of the way. Stay right where you are. We will give you the Southwest Conference story when we come back. Spike Dykes' Red Raiders are tough in Lubbock against Arkansas. They're SEC bound to that story when we return. Back to our college football studios. I am Tim Brando, and we're going to update you now on some scores taking place in the Big East as well as the Southwest Conference. Boy, Paul Hackett got off to that great start. It has been rough sledding for him since. And the Rutgers Scarlet Knights under Coach Graber are a much better ball club. And Tom Tarver is the reason why. Trying to get their first offensive touchdown in 11 quarters. Problems early. Ball is picked off in the air by Charles Williams. But the ball kept bouncing to Pitt, it seemed, all through the game. Watch this. Tarver will find Lance Avina this time, but he is stripped of the football right there, and Tinker Harris will catch it. That led to this bootleg by Alex Van Pelt, capping the drive to make it 17-10 at the half. Tarver, a one-yard sneak for a touchdown, and now it is a 20-10 ball game. Van Pelt has gone 38 yards to Dave Moore as well. Also in the Big East, BC against Temple. It's 21-6 now. Glenn Foley, a couple of touchdown passes in the game. Virginia Tech, the boys from VPI are leading Akron 21-10. Fuller to Bill Campbell, a big touchdown. Illinois and Purdue as we move back to the Big Ten. And it's a 14-0 lead in the second quarter of that one. On to the Southeastern Conference. Jerry DiNardo trying to pull the 500, leading Bill Curry's Cats 3-0 at the intermission. On to the Southwest Conference. And today, Arkansas feeling the pinch from that loss against Baylor last week, having problems. Pete Rather's punt is blocked by number 92, Steve Carr. Now the same drive, first and goal at the nine. Robert Hall's favorite receiver all year has been Rodney Blackshear. And the Red Raiders take a 10-0 lead at that point. Hogs, 15 and one in Lubbock. There you see Anthony Lynn with a 12-yard run to update it, 17-7. You see Arkansas next week against Texas A&M in prime time on ESPN. Wake Forest taking on the Blue Devils. Game now in the second quarter. A Couple of field goals in the ball game for Mike Green. Georgia Tech and Furman, the Purple Paladins in the second quarter trailing. Michael Smith with a four-yard run. Cincinnati as we move to the Independence, leading Middle Tennessee State out of Division I AA. The folks from Murfreesboro down by 4-14-10. Miami of Ohio as we go to the MAC. Now leading Western Michigan 14-7. Jim Clement to Bob Clark, a 15-yard strike. Ohio U in Eastern Michigan. The game now 7-3 at the half. Tom Curtis, a seven-yard touchdown run. Kent, the Golden Flash coming off their first win of the year a week ago, now leading Bowling Green, who appeared to be Raisin Bowl bound. Maybe not. Stay with us. We've got a lot more on the way. Speaking of Division One AA, we will have that story when we come back as our college football score machine rolls on. Ohio State has things going their way. Tipped passes and more against the Golden Gophers at the Hanky Dome. The Tar Heels are at home for Mac Brown. They pitched a shutout defensively. They'll need to play tough tonight against the Tigers in a key ACC game. But coming up before that, you got to hunker down, you hairy dogs. That's right. That's the way Larry Munson would say it, the play-by-play -play man. And it is the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. Georgia has a shot against the fun and gun of Florida. Here are Sean McDonough and Craig James with a preview. Thank you, Tim, and welcome, everybody, to Jacksonville. It is certainly not a typical Florida day. Chilly temperatures. It'll be in the mid-40s at game time. And we're about two blocks from the Gator Bowl. Between us and the Gator Bowl, a sea of RVs. Some of these people have been here since Wednesday night. 
Now, this game used to be known as the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. It is no longer. The fans here on their best behavior, but still, Craig, this is quite a spectacle. I grew up in the Southwest. OU Texas was a big ball game, but this dwarfs that game. And a lot at stake here today. The Florida Gators looking ahead, perhaps, to their first official SEC football championship. Do we have any Gator fans here today? <laughs> And do we have anybody here from the great state of Georgia? <laughs> the tickets evenly divided. 41,000 tickets have gone to each school. Game time, 4 o'clock Eastern time. We'll have it for you here on ESPN. And for those folks who can't get to the stadium, it's on TV right over here. They have a satellite hookup, ESPN, right outside this RV. Now back to Tim. Where would we be without satellites, Sean? By the way, the Chamber of Commerce in Jacksonville doesn't like it being called the world's largest outdoor cocktail party, but neither does the Chamber of Commerce like Tobacco Road being mentioned as the triangle in Carolina. But it's a war, and you like Florida, don't you? Yeah, I like Florida. One of the reasons also that Shane Matthews last week developed a new offensive plan for Florida. He goes back to pass, and when it opens up, instead of scrambling right and left, he takes off running the ball. With that, makes Florida almost impossible to stop. I like the Gators by 10. You know, Georgia is one of those teams on the cusp for the 6th Division 1A victory to qualify them and make them eligible for a bowl game. Remember, this rule implemented this year, and you really like the fact that Georgia has a shot. Don't you? I, I like Georgia. I watched their program last Wednesday. They got a good-looking football team. They're well-coached, but they're overmatched with Florida. Florida's one of the top five or six teams in the nation, without a question. Remember this, though, about the Georgia Bulldogs. Should they lose this game, they have to beat Auburn. They don't have that sixth win, and then somebody may have to roll the dice on that Georgia Tech game. You're right. All right, stay right where you are. We have got a lot more coming your way as our halftime report rolls on. It's 21-3. to 3. It's been snow on top of snow and Carlos Snow against Minnesota today. We welcome you back. Let's quickly update you now on the Gamecocks and the Seminoles. In that ball game, Amp Lee has gone to work one more time against South Carolina. Here he is, taking it off tackle for the touchdown. And they are now leading it by a score of 24 to 10 are the Seminoles, the nation's number one ranked team. Nebraska and Kansas. Kansas looking for its first winning season. Here is Mike Sticky back to punt. Hassan Bailey would pick it up. And look at the Jayhawks feeling good about themselves and why not the score is three nothing that would lead to a field goal it is three nothing in the first quarter osborne has never lost to the jayhawks and texas tech taking on arkansas and the red raiders beginning to roll now it is 24 to 7 and they are looking for their fourth win of the year all right so far in the big 10 it has been all ohio state they still have michigan on their schedule but they also have one half remaining against Minnesota. Let's get back out to the guys that aren't the Icemen, Steve and Gary. Thank you, Tim. It's 21 to three. Ohio State, the number 19 team in the nation, leading the Minnesota Golden Gophers. I'm Steve Fiziak, along with Gary Danielson. And in the first half, Minnesota had that very impressive first drive, and then their defense really straightened Yeah, the itself. story of the game for Minnesota is they're not able to block on passing situations. Alonzo Spellman, he just overpowers on pass rush. Here you see a third and long situation where Spellman just runs through Roberts right here and really four guys could have had a sack on this play right here and there was a hold called on the play. On offense, Carlos Snow has been the spark so far in this football game. He had 71 yards in the first half and he looks to be one of the vintage backs in Big Ten football this year. He's got power, he has speed, and he's really run through this Minnesota defense. But Kent Graham had a good first half in this game. He gained 39 yards and a bulk of it on the option play right here. And this seemed to me to keep Minnesota enough off balance, plus his throwing, to build this 21-3 halftime lead. Well, Ohio State will receive the second half kickoff. They lead by 18 after falling down 3-0 on the Michael Chalberg 24-yard field goal. And as you take a look at that first half stats, Ohio State mainly 
took control of that time of possession in that second quarter where they had the football seemed like the entire 15 minutes. Yeah, the one turnover was key, especially since it followed a long drive and their defense had to go right back on the field and they really never got control of the field position game. And John Gutekunst told us that that was the problem with this football team all year. In the first half also, they were inside the 20-yard line twice in the first half. The first time they kicked the field goal, the second time they came away with nothing. So when you have a chance to score against this great Ohio State football team, you got to put more than a field goal on the board. Well, Kent Graham had a five first half, completing six of eight passes for 80 yards. He is still thrown for only four touchdowns this year, and he will get the chance. First possession, second half, as Aaron Peepcorn will kick off to Carlos Snow and Dante Lee. And Snow, the all-time kickoff return leader in Ohio State history, he passed the legendary Hopalong Cassidy earlier this year. They kick it to Dante Lee's side. He takes it. Now Snow cuts in front of him, and Carlos gets it back near the 20-yard line. We had heard Carlos Snow wasn't going to play a lot, that he hadn't practiced much this week with that concussion he suffered against Iowa, but he's been out there playing a lot of football, and he looks to be very, very healthy for this football game. You know, I'd, hate to think, I'd hate to think what he looks like if he's not. You know, those backs get the rhythm. <laughs> they do not want to come off the field, and he has been in the rhythm the last three weeks. Ohio State's last four possessions, four touchdowns, and the missed field goal. You can see that one great drive, 11 plays, but the other two on their own, 24 and 19 yard line for Minnesota. That was really death for this Minnesota football team. The 22, Snow cannot get by the outside cornerback, Drenone Mays. Yeah, Drenone Mays, again, up there for the running attack, and that's why the option football has been so good. They've tilted the defense to the short side of the field to take away that power running game, and the option to the wide side of the field has been good for them. There's John Gutekunst. He is in a pressure pack situation, but he said pressure is in the business. The guys who I admire are the ones who get up every day and do their job. Uh, it's his job to bring Minnesota back in this football game. They are at the 24-yard line, the Buckeyes. The Gophers defense will try and pin him back, but Ken Graham finds his big tight end, Cedric Saunders, who will get the first down out past the 35-yard line, a gain of 18. Well, that's what Kent Graham seems to me that he gives this Ohio State offense. He looks very more, very much comfortable running the offense. I mean, early in the year, there's a lot of question marks whether Herb Street would play, Pickens, you know, a great two-time All-American quarterback out of St. Ignatius was going to play. But uh, John Cooper is stuck with Kent Graham, and it looks to me that he's very comfortable running the offense right now. From the 37. Yeah, Russ Heath saw that pitch fake a couple times, and this time he said, I'm not going for that baby anymore. If you're going to pitch it, somebody else is going to make the tackle. I've got you on this option from now on. Wasn't there a song by that? I've got you, babe. Sonny <laughs> 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 and Cher. <laughs> yeah. Right? I knew you'd finish the sentence. <laughs> Leading tacklers. Spellman had four in the first half. Mathis, how about that youngster from Minnesota? And, and you know his dad, dad right? Yeah, real well. Mike Mathis, an NBA referee, one of the best. Yeah, he started for Davis, who was their leading tackler. Come on, this game. All of his sons are really tough. Bernard Edwards with the catch out of bounds near the 45-yard line. Very simple play that time again. They've been able to run the ball to the, from the eye formation, and this time he sets back, gathers his feet, and delivers it to the underneath route, and they're able to pick up nine yards to set up that third and short yardage play. This is what Ohio State wasn't able to do versus Iowa, set up situations where they could convert on third down. It's going to be key as they head into Indiana and Michigan, their final two games. Well, you got a third one, and Snow gets the first down and a bundle more. He's inside the 40-yard line. You know, again, it was a third and one, and they didn't have many third and one situations against Iowa. No, they got sacked in that game a, a lot, and in the first half, they had a time of possession with them that early roughing the punter play really hurt them against Iowa. They never really got control of the clock. That first half, they had the ball only four minutes in the first half against Iowa. They were never able to establish the ground game. And then when they went and lost Carlos Snow, they kind of went away from their game plan. 91 yards rushing after Snow. They'll throw the pass, and it's behind Galloway incomplete. 
got a nice mix off that option. Sometimes they give it to the fullback. Sometimes the quarterback keeps it. Other times they pitch it back. This time it's the option pass. He's going to fake. That looks like an option play. You see Graham trying to get Galloway in between the zones. Galloway, I don't think, really saw the football. It got on him a little too fast because that was a catchable ball. Nobody's fault on the play. Graham just got it there and, and with good timing. Galloway was still trying to get away from the jam. Second down, Scotty Graham inside the 30-yard line. So it'll bring up a third down short situation. You know, you, you got to wonder right now if John Cooper isn't calling a game plan right now, thinking about Indiana and Michigan. He's showing a lot of option football right here. This time it's going to be a handoff, but it's off the option action. And you wonder with a 21-3 lead right here, if he isn't setting up some strategy for his next two games, forcing Mallory and Moeller to defense the option first, which will set up his power game. Benote, first down, he's to the 20-yard line before he's hauled down by Russ Heath, outside linebacker, a sophomore from Aurora, Colorado. Well, you get a lot of fans in Columbus, Ohio, and talk about the great days of Woody Hayes. But what you're seeing right here, I think, is the beginning of a Woody Hayes-type era for John Cooper at Ohio State. He's got a young offensive line. He's got three sophomores and two juniors. And he's got a stable of running backs. And he's changed the focus of this football team to tough, hard-hitting offense. And it's going to pay off for him. Yeah, he said, we have the best team I've ever coached. They'll send it to Benote. Benote's got another first down inside the 10. The only thing Butler Benote needs to do is watch how Carlos Snow runs the football. Because if he emulates him, he'll learn to be a great running back. He has all the talent that he needs to play that position. He just is trying to turn every play into a touchdown. That last one was the way Butler Benote has to run the ball. The way Carlos Snow right there learned to run it through his career at Ohio State. From the eight-yard line, it is first and goal. the five he has better than 50 yards rushing snow has 91 yards rushing you know, i did big eight football for a number of years and john cooper was in tulsa and he used to come into that conference and just beat up the oklahoma states the missouris the kansas states of the world then he goes on to arizona state and his national coach of the year in 1986 he is a fine football coach. Yeah. His problem at Ohio State, though, is he has not won the big game against a winning team here at Ohio State. He has to do that to keep those people happy. But I'll tell you again, he slides toward that goal line, and they will mark him down near the one. Yeah, you wonder what Minnesota as a defensive staff can do now. Tom Gadd, the defensive coordinator, is looking out and saying, we're getting pushed around. Our people are up there trying to do something and stop them, but I might have to put our 11, 12, 13 guys on the field to stop this offensive line. They're just too powerful, and we're, they're on their heels the whole drive right here because of the option and the power that Ohio State is showing in this third quarter. 12th play of the drive coming, third goal. Boy, the run to the right is there. But okay, touchdown. Minnesota load their defense to the remaining back. I think Kent Graham had a check with me call, meaning he had two plays in the huddle called left and right. He saw the overload to his left-hand side, just like we saw it up here in the box, and called the 26th play to the corner. You'll see Minnesota to the uh, strong side, to the field right there. Good block into the end zone, and the speed just gets them in there for six more points. So Williams comes on for his fifth time today. One to kick off, and the other four following touchdowns. I always feel like Hank Stram when I say the run to the right is there. You know, I, <laughs> Hank's my hero. <laughs> and Tim Williams puts it through. Well, as Hank Stram would say, you bet. <laughs> They're handling them right now. <laughs>
28 to 3 Ohio State and there is Ohio State's get tough guy Elliot Uslock he said we had to get tougher this year demand more and the offensive coordinator said the kids wanted it as well yeah he, he's really turned into a Buckeye real fast when we met with him the last time we did a game he said you know like that team up north we're going to learn how to run the ball and put some helmets in some people's faces and in the long run that's going to turn Ohio State football back into the program it was before another impressive drive by Ohio State they go 77 yards 12 plays and Bonante has the touchdown from a yard out it's the fourth rushing touchdown of this game this really does surprise me that Ohio State was able to push around this Minnesota defense this easily in this football game I thought they'd have more trouble running the ball John Lewis Since replacing White, he has played well. Let's go to Tim Brando. Tom Osborne was concerned about looking beyond the Jayhawks. Here's a reason why. Chip Hillary, 50 yards on the little look-in to Dwayne Chandler. And the Jayhawks have the lead over the Huskers, 10-0 in the first. Stay tuned. Wow, and Kansas State earlier took uh, Nebraska to task before losing 38-31. And here we are at the Hubert H. Humphrey Metrodome in Minneapolis, where Minnesota is down 28-3 to Ohio State. They give it a Carter, and he's got a short gain in there. Well, you know, this University of Minnesota collegiate program is known for the world's first full body x-ray machine and right now they need to get an x-ray and find out what's wrong with the Minnesota offense a team that averaged 20 points per game last year only nine and they have just almost stopped since their first drive. They really lack speed so that puts all the pressure on the quarterback and the man calling the plays and right now with the injuries in the offensive line there's really not much he can dial against this great defense that Ohio State has against the run. James King who had that 55 yard run earlier when you zero in on Tovar and Judah Herman number 36 and remember the pinpoint of that defense number 57 Gress, Greg Smith who's such a great nose tackle you really understand why it's tough to run the ball inside against Ohio State the other thing you have to look at for Ohio State is they put Alonzo Spellman in a wide spot. They force people to run the ball inside of him, and that's very tough. You're funneling it back to two great inside linebackers. Well, out of the wishbone, they give it a Carter, and he blasts forward for the first down, what is near a first down. There's they already have the X-rays. There's one of my best picks. That could be one of any one of my X-rays. Well, like I said, Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, they invented that first full body X-ray machine. That is. Is that the Minnesota offense there? Okay, now this is the part where we're having trouble. When you have to X-ray to find a good play, you're in trouble in the game plan. They've had so many injuries this year. On first and ten. to the tight end pass is one of their favorite plays, but it's read nicely by Ohio State's defense. That time, the outside corner, Timmy Walton that time, pushed the wide receiver outside and immediately looked up the tight end coming across. At halftime, they said, on the bootleg corners, when you push him across, look for that tight end. And boom, here he comes across right there. And if he had not run into Tobar, that would have been an interception. And you know who gets hurt on a play? Tobar. When two guys get bumped into each other, they, they, your own guy gets hurt. Tovar had 11 tackles last week against Iowa, but remember, Iowa ran had twice the yardage and had twice the plays that Ohio State did. You can't count tackles as a few measurements. Well, they're just eating up the run right now, and Judah Herman is the man leading the way from Bainbridge, Ohio. He makes another tackle, and Carter is stopped for a loss of two. Penn State's big on Maryland, 24-0. Well, you really should get all over Northwestern, 45-7. We've got to check out and find out how many more Desmond Howard might have. And the big one later today, Indiana and Iowa. This might be the battle to find out who goes to the thrifty Holiday Bowl. Yeah, because of Iowa's victory over Ohio State last week and because of the matchups, them beating both Indiana and Iowa, Michigan would have to lose twice not to go to the Rose Bowl. Cleveland in trouble, escapes the pressure, gets the first down, the pass to his tight end, Pat Evans. 
you boot, you call a bootleg away from the tight end, you call it a waggle toward the tight end. This time the action went away from the tight end, and he comes back on the waggle to Pat Evans. When those corners start to look for the tight end crossing to the weak side, you run the waggle and stay to the strong side. A good changeup by John Huber, the offensive coordinator for Minnesota there. Why do they call it a waggle? I don't know. <laughs> I was just waiting for this excellent interpretation of the waggle play. Fleetwood stepping up, looping it to Joy Elliott, a catch at the 30-yard line. I have to be careful now. He slammed the ball right there, but when you make a one-handed catch, you're allowed to do it. That's as nice as it can go right there. Lays out. Joiner, a former high school quarterback right here, shows how all great quarterbacks can catch the ball. <laughs> Lays out one hand, tips it back to himself, and catches it with his other hand. Fleetwood, off the play action again, steps up in the pocket, which he has to do. Lays it out, just a little bit overthrown, but the receiver comes through to make the play. Carter, 25, 15-yard line. Carter's to the 12, and a Minnesota first down. 17-yard run by Antonio Carter. Yeah, with Chuck Rio out, Antonio Carter is their best athlete running the football. In high school, he high jumped six foot five, long jump 21 feet. This time he busts it back, steps just inside Timmy Walton, and he's into the secondary right here. Gives a couple moves and has a very positive play. The key to this drive has been Fleetwood's ability to throw the ball. That's when it's really opened up the running game their first drive of this game, and they've got a first down of the 12. Option this way. Fleetwood on a keeper near the six-yard line. Let's go to Tim Brando. Steve, remember when I told you to stay tuned on Kansas? Watch Chip Hillary this time. This is your basic rumbling, bumbling, stumbling, and then the block by Matt Gay right here, a springing Chip Hillary into the end zone. 17-0 Jayhawks in the first. He could go all the way. Timmy, I don't want to say that Steve's rooting here, but he was standing up during that highlight right now, there. Now I want you to remember, I went to Kansas State. Well, anybody Kansas in that general area, area. <laughs> general area. It was a civil war in our own family. <laughs> Second and four, Fleetwood. Yeah, I think the referee's calling a timeout right here because the quarterback is hurt, and he wants to get Fleetwood off the field right now. Fleetwood got hurt on that option play, and the referee signaled the timeout. Let's see if we can take a look at how he got hit and what got hurt right here. Like it matters what got hurt, he's hurt. But here it is on the option play, he tucks it inside, makes the move, he's slightly off balance. I think Ooh. it's a hip pointer, his right hip took this to the, the, the punishment right there. And I think he got hit right on the right hip, and that's a, a problem. So you know the diagnosis. Do you know if we'll be back? <laughs> well, a waggle is called... <laughs> <laughs> Scott Schaefer is going to come in right here. and See the hit come in right from the right side and boom, right on his right hip. And believe me, when you run option football, that's where you get a bunch of... Schaefer in there. He's out of that great high school power in Cincinnati, Bowler High. With the wishbone, Carter leaping the top. He nears the four. Kutikunch really likes that fella, Mark L. Fleetwood, saying, you know, he is so talented, but we need to build people around him. The most consistent our football has, team has been is when we had Ricky Foggy and Daryl Thompson on the same team. Yeah, they had some speed right there, and now Schaffner is going to have to make a play here. Third, and, and this much difference, it's going to be tough, tough for them to run the ball up the middle and pick it up. Third and two. Ohio State is extremely wide. Carter, uh -huh. Fourth down. The Ohio State defense was st uh, stacked extremely wide. There you see Gutekunst's going to call timeout to talk about this. The reason he's calling timeout is he wants to get Fleetwood back in the game for this fourth down call. All right, it's 28 to 3, but Gutekunst knocking on the touchdown door. Markel Fleetwood is back in. His team trails by 25. It is fourth and three for Minnesota at the Buckeye five-yard line. Lewis in motion. Fleetwood a time throw. It's intercepted. Tim Walton. The man replaced.
replace the injured Brian Cook snuffs out that fourth down attempt by the Gophers. For the second time, Fleetwood tried to get to the ball to a slanting type receiver late over the middle. He beat the initial play but someone else came across to make the play and knock the ball down. When you throw the slant pass that close to the middle of the field, the defenders on the back side of the formation are the ones that are kind of come and make the play. You must throw that slant wider to the strong side, the fit side you have your eyes on. Throwing slants over the middle of the field is very, very dangerous. And once again, Chico Nelson was right in the middle of it. He is one of their hardest hitters in the team. I remember a game against Arizona earlier this year. He hit the guy so hard, both of his contact lenses popped out of his head. We've got a chance to check out the rest of college football today as Holy Cross is up on Bucknell. And it's good to see Chico up on his feet as well. Well, that was a, a beautiful drive by Markel Fleetwood. Remember the pressure that Minnesota is putting on this young man. They do not have a lot of speed, and they're asking him to do practically everything in this offense. Any mistake is magnified because he has the ball all the time in this game. And anything he does, he has to run option, he has to run the bootleg, he has to drop back and pass, and, and, and every little mistake that's being forced by the rush is going to magnify on the quarterback right here. Ken Graham takes over with his Buckeyes leading 28 to 3. Football six yard line. Edwards in motion. Carlos Snow back in there, a short game of two yards. He now is 93 for the game. You know, some of the credit we really haven't given is the to this great offensive line for uh, Ohio State. You see Fleetwood on the, on the bench. He was putting an ice pack on that injured right hip as he was sitting right there. But you know, Alan Klein, who they compared to Jumbo Elliott, the fine uh, offensive tackle from Michigan, is now into the pros. Lenny Hartman, Paul Long, Mono, and Ridro have done an excellent job pushing around this Minnesota unit all day. Snow again, they run the short side of the field. And Carlos is out of bounds near the 10-yard line. Pushed out by Bruno and Mays. Well, for a guy who wasn't supposed to play too much because he didn't practice, we're seeing a lot of Carlos Snow. And understand, going into the two big, big games at Ohio State, you know, for everyone's sake, as you can see, we see another guy down on the field. I mean, I really think that uh, John Cooper saying, I, we don't need to rest anybody. We've got a good pattern going on our offense, and we want to go into our last two games versus Indiana, which we will be there for, and the big Michigan game to be running on all cylinders. He doesn't need to rest anybody right now. Yeah, we saw representatives of the Blockbuster Bowl and the Hancock Bowl, and I uh, understand the Hancock Bowl is we don't very wanna, aggressive. We don't want to say anything. That might get some people down in Iowa a little bit upset. I mean, we have to be honest about this. There have been a lot of rumblings around Big Ten territory about the deal that was put together in the Big Ten that is going to send this year the second place team to a nice site. I mean, let's not kid anybody. Everybody likes to go to San Diego, but everybody understands that when you're in second place and you have a chance to play in a New Year's Day Bowl, Iowa, if they go 10 and 1, will not be excited about that. Markel Fleetwood back on his feet. Let's see if he comes back out. We've got Georgia coming up later today, the number 23 Bulldogs against Florida. The sixth rated team in the country and later tonight, 730 Eastern Time, Clemson against North Carolina, a game at Chapel Hill. Good defense by Clemson. ACC has had some strange ones today. Virginia all over NC State. That's an injury that will get worse as it goes on. It'll be sore tomorrow than it is today, and it'll be a sore an hour from now. He won't be walking around much tonight after this football game. He's going to have to keep ice on it to remain in the game the rest of this football game. You know, on our primetime games, we have Dr. Jerry Punch. Jerry Punch, who can not only analyze the plays in the field, but the call it. Now we've got Dr. Gary Danders, former quarterback. <laughs> well, they stack him up on third down. Very conservative play calling on that drive. Right now, John Cooper knows he's got this game well in hand, and he does not need a turnover to get Minnesota Bass back in the game. Elliot Uslock's not happy the way uh, his offensive line pushed back Minnesota that time. So Tim Williams drops back there. Kick it to Lewis Garrison. Full 
Harper should get it in good field position, but Williams hits it well. 40-yard line. Harris brings it back to the 45. We've got a timeout of the field, 4-13 remaining third quarter. The Buckeyes big on Minnesota. Despite a painful bruised right hip, Markel Fleetwood is coming out offensively as Minnesota has their best field position to start a drive today at their own 46-yard line. And Fleetwood completed nine of his first 11 passes. And he is now 12 for 20 on the game. And they'll run it to Carter, who's up near midfield. Yeah, Markel Fleetwood will not remain in this football game. He just cannot do it. He barely can hand that ball off. And I would not be surprised. There he comes. He is coming off. I'm not surprised. A hip pointer is not a serious injury. It's a hip bruise. But it just it makes it almost impossible to run full speed. It'll tighten up on him, and it'll get worse. And I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> And I'm going to go out on a limb here. Wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't on crutches after leaving this stadium after the game. Thank you, Dr. Daniels. <laughs> Carter past midfield near the 47. But Ohio State might be getting ready. Their backup quarterback for Herb Street as Kent Graham has had a very efficient day leading his team to four touchdowns. It's Herb Street really an option quarterback, a wishbone QB in high school. Yeah, and this is a good idea, getting Herb Street some playing time, too, going into two big games. If they want to free feature the, the, the option game, Herb Street is a little bit better at just the option football than Ken Graham right now. Shoffner ah! dumps it off. King! He can't hold on, or he would have had the first down. He was being chased by Steve Tobar. Spellman was right in Schaffner's face that time, and he made an excellent throw with it rolling to his left. Here you see Spellman come, puts his hand on it. Now look at that throw. That's as well as you can throw the ball. Waist tie, puts it right on King's hands, and King cannot come up with the catch, forcing a punt in this football game. Look at the arms on that guy. Yeah. It's going to be in Terminator 3 all day. <laughs> Kaufman, as long as today, 38. Something like water. Something Stave like line back, standing at his 10. He calls for the fair catch and makes the play at the 17-yard line. Let's go to Tim Brando. The Kansas Jayhawks have lost 22 straight times to Nebraska, Steve. Here on the option, Calvin Jones will get it in from four yards out, but the Jayhawks are still leading in the second quarter, 17 to seven. 17 to seven. Kansas State went back and forth with Nebraska a couple of weeks ago and almost pulled off their first win since the 1950s. But we see Kirk Herbstreit come out at quarterback for Ohio State, a 6'2 junior from Centerville, Ohio. Would not be surprised if you see more option football. Again, Indiana, Michigan watching films of this game are going to have to be faced with a lot of time of option football. <laughs> that option and pitch it out to Benote, who's to the 20. And he's got that good body laid out near the 27-yard line. Very tough to defense a team that's able to run strong side, isolation play, and option weak side. And Kent Graham had a nice football game running the option. A lot of people doubt whether he can do it. He doesn't have to be, you know, a 4-4 option quarterback. All he has to do is give the defense a taste of the option to open up that powerful running game inside with Carlos Snow. Very impressed with the improvement of Kent Graham's. Too bad he's a senior that in his last year, because I really think he can improve as a playing player. Benote slips and falls down. That's really what Butler Benote has to do better if he's going to be a top-notch running back in the Big Ten. When the play isn't there, on second and short like that, he needs to just take it up inside, get what he can get, and line up third and one instead of taking a loss. And it may not be a bad idea to buy some spikes. The cleats for the game. Cleats. Cleats, spikes, spikes might rubber, rubber. The defense. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the old yards time. rushing. Now we're going to go back. In 1970, they were called spikes. <laughs> Gary Daniels had played football and ran for over 200 yards in one half. And they said he couldn't run the option. But no check. Not near the 28-yard line. And I, I think that just highlights the problem right there. Instead of it being third and a half yard, it was third and two, and he might be short on a fourth down play right here. He will learn that. I mean, he's got great blocking fullbacks in front of him and Cothran and Graham, and of course, Ohio State will have another one. He did get it. But that's what a great running back has to do. If there's nothing there, get what you can out of the play and line it up again. 
You know, this Ohio State football program, which there have been so many rumors tossed around, but you remember he had that fourth and one situation last year against Michigan, and if they make it and maybe go down and kick the field goal when it was tied at 13 all, John Cooper might have gotten the extension, gone to the Rose Bowl, recruiting wouldn't have been a, a trouble. Now, Gordon D has to make the, the decision on whether to keep, but they have to make it. There's state line who cannot bring it in near the 30-yard line. Really looked like their feet got tangled up a little bit. And he really did go out and try to make that play. This is a play that Ohio State has been featuring all game, a fake to the wide side, two wide receivers, and they've run, been running the curl off of it. This time they fake the curl and go deep, and the ball is just slightly overthrown, and Stabline can't come up with it. It's a nice throw by Herb Street right there. And again, I believe that Ohio State right now and Elliot Uzelak right now is working on next week's game plan. From here on in, he's showing things that he wants to show to the next two teams. Herb Street running the option, keeps it himself, past the 35, he's got the first down. And he's still going. Yeah, he will score. Look at this. Herb Street. Tackling and he saw it by his defense that time as Kirk Herbstreit, the backup quarterback, goes 72 yards. Yeah, he's a real favorite on this football team. His dad was a high school coach, he was a coach at Ohio State. And, and he's he, John Cooper's number one recruit. Absolutely. When he came to Ohio State, he gave it. Now you'll see right here that his speed is a little bit more impressive than Kent Graham. Kent Graham would have got about eight yards on this play. The really strong option quarterback. Everybody thinks he's down right there. Minnesota relaxes for a second, and Finote comes in, lays it out, and gives just enough room for Herb Street to turn it in to six more points. That is a terrific run. High stepping it into the end zone. And Williams comes on, and Ohio State takes themselves a 35-3 lead over Minnesota. Let's go to Tim Brando. Can you say route? Take a look at this fake field goal, Steve. Jim Garantano happens to be the best wide receiver on the Scarlet Knights team. He passes to Tim Pernity for a touchdown. Just over five to play. Hackett's wheels continue to come off at Pitt. And here in Minneapolis, 35 to three is Ohio State. Bidding to go seven and two this year and on yeah. another bowl game. Now you, you see you see all the guys pointing up what they're doing right now is watching the replay on the screen of that touchdown run. You don't have, even have to wait till Sunday to watch the highlights. You can watch it right on the sideline now. This is great. There it is. There's the replay. They just finished it up right now. Marvelous job by our producer Susie Evans and director Scott Johnson. Everybody on our staff here in Minneapolis. That fella can bear to watch. There's a guy who missed the tackle. One more look at it on the big screen. This is what the people in Minnesota are watching. I don't know if they show this one more time. We might have a mass exit. It's a fan leaving the stadium. Here's the reverse angle. We have great technology here now. We've got so many cameras. We're going to see it from the end zone. And you'll see Minnesota stop. They feel he's down. He breaks through, but note he's going to come in and get the clip. And it's great when you have 10 cameras to show these different angles like this. <laughs> and this beats doing a game out in the snow right now when it's 35 to 3, doesn't it? Well, I'm glad we didn't have to do it from historic Memorial Stadium. <laughs> and the fans are beginning to leave, seeing their ball club down 35 to 3. We have 30,000 on hand, but hey, it's a beginning of deer season here in Minnesota. <laughs> Five-yard line. Tovar wraps him up. Kirk Herbstreit, he's probably on the phone with his mom. <laughs> Did you see that, mom? He yeah, we, saw, we saw it 12 times in replays. That's not bad. 72-yard run. You saw Seagull go. Let's go tonight. Kicks my ass. Well, well, okay. You can only say that Call on cable. Mom. You can only say <laughs> It wasn't his mom he was talking to, I guess. <laughs> Dad. <laughs> They'll run the reverse. Keswick Joyner, but three Buckeyes wrap him up near the 30-yard line. They were not fooled. Tovar, Rich Frimmel. Yeah, Ohio 
State's defense has really bottled up this Minnesota. The only time Minnesota has been able to move the ball effectively, as you're looking at more and more scores again, is through the air and keeping them off balance. They have not been able to run the ball effectively at all. Number one, Florida State now big after being just up on South Carolina 17 to 7. It was 34 to 7. We will enter the fourth quarter. Buckeyes are smiling and they have good reason to. They are up 35 to 3 on the Minnesota Golden Gophers. And the future for Ohio State. Kent Graham, a senior quarterback, visiting with redshirt freshman Joe Pickens, an outstanding redshirt freshman out of the Cleveland area. And they really feel he is going to be a special quarterback in years to come. Minnesota trailing 35 to 3. And Shocker trying the middle. Not much there. It'll be a third down. James King got the call. The other side, Derek Fisher, cornerback with the starting quarterback, Markel Fleetman, who had a strong game before going out with that hip injury. Michigan has begun the third quarter and is up on Northwestern, 45 to seven. Yeah, the only North difference Davis is beating Tennessee, 31 to seven. The only difference in that game and this game is they're cold and we're very comfortable here. Hopewell goes in motion and it's incomplete. He tried to hit Pat Evans, his big tight end. Once again, we've got college football coming your way following this contest. You know, I think one other name you can throw into that Ohio State quarterback derby, and I don't know really if it's a, anyone really cares right now for 1992, is a fellow by the name of Bobby Hoyne. He's being redshirted this year as a freshman, and he will compete with Herb Street and Pickens for that job next year. And he will have, whoever gets that job, will have a good football team to run next year. Kaufman. As the rush was on, he did not get off a strong kick, and it bounced straight in the air, where it's taken by Minnesota after a 22-yard punt by Dean Kaufman. Now, Gary, we were talking about that Holly Bowl. Right now, Iowa, Indiana, still Ohio State and Illinois in pursuit of that Holiday Bowl later in December against the WAC champion in a game that uh, you can watch on ESPN next week. Brigham Young going against San Diego State and San Diego State just a game behind. Well, Brigham Young. I think that would be a very attractive game, but the, the point is, you know, when you're a second place team, you don't care where you have to play. You want to play the best team you can play, the most high, the highest ranked team you can play. Herb Street remains the quarterback. And he'll run the move play. He'll throw that football over the head of Joey Galloway. Coming your way tomorrow, game day, with Chris Berman and his friends at noon Eastern time. A preview of all the NFL games and then a review on prime time at 7 o'clock Eastern time. And, of course, we have our Sunday night special on ESPN. The New England Patriots against the Miami Dolphins and Dan Marino, 8 o'clock Eastern time, right here on ESPN. Uh, Raymond Harris, excuse me, who comes in for Butler Benote. Raymond is that sophomore from Lorraine, Ohio. Yeah, in 1990, he was the number two rusher on this Ohio State team, and that's when they had Robert Smith on the football team. So if you talk about a stable of backs that you can dial up at Ohio State, I don't think there's a, none better anywhere in the country of four or five deep. Harris, Benote, Snow, and Graham, but Snow was out last year. You know, you wonder, you know, a first down pass by Ohio State when you're winning 35 to 3, why are they running up the score? I never really look at it Play this way. Was a muff rather than a fumble, therefore the ball is spotted where it went out of bounds. Third down. Makes sense to me. John Cooper's not going to argue, not when you're leading by 32 points in the fourth quarter with 14 minutes to play. Harris remains in the game, lone setback. Three wide receivers, and Herb Street to throw. They release it to Raymond, and Minnesota's defense will read this one nicely. Ben Williams' defensive end chases him down. 
And the point I was trying to make, you know, Ohio State comes out leading 35 to three and they're throwing the ball. Is that running up the score? No, not, absolutely not. What you're trying to do is get your second line people ready to play football in case you have an injury coming into two key football games. That man has to be happy with the effort going into this football game. I asked him before the game, coach, you know, you just got knocked basically out of the Big Ten title hunt. Will your team be down for this game coming off the big loss to Iowa? He said, absolutely not. If anything, we're a little bit ticked off with the way we played. We think we got a great football team and we want to finish on a strong note. And Coach Cooper said, hey, we had a great week of practice. And that is all in preparation. Minnesota Gopher is down near the sideline. You know, it's Big Ten. To being always that league of three yards in a cloud of dust has been so impressive this year in the country standings. I mean, next week we get a chance to take a look at the nation's best running back in Vaughn Dunbar, who leads the nation in rushing with 1,284 yards going into today's 3:30 game with Iowa. Elvis Gerback is second in passing efficiency. Desmond Howard, uh, first in scoring. He scored his 20th touchdown today. Well, we've got Indiana coming your way next week on ESPN. Uh, against the Ohio State Buckeyes. Here it's 35 to 3 OSU. Lately. We saw that snow on the ground outside. Funny story developed yesterday after the worst snowstorm. We stopped to help a young lady out of a snowbank. Quarterback Dick Gary Danielson takes over. There's the run back. And it's a nice one. Lewis Garrison is out past the 45-yard line. Tim Brando, what do you have for us? Well, you just had a nice return. Let me show you one even better than that, Steve. This is Michael James, and he is saying as he goes into the end zone with some good blocking, oh, pig suey. We're still in the Southwest Conference title hunt. They get A&M next week. All right, it's 35-3 Ohio State. Five-yard line, Schaffner to Keswick Joyner. It's incomplete. And just to finish the story about our good Samaritan, Gary Danielson, you know, we get out of the car to help her out of the snowbank, and there's about five people milling around, and we're wondering what to do. And all of a sudden, you start audibleizing. Okay, you guys push from the back. Roll down your windows. We're going to pull here. And you over there, you direct traffic. I'm going, oh, this is great. The quarterback's <laughs> taking over. There he is. My man. Right you got to tell every story. I'm not going out with this guy ever again right here. <laughs> Well, they were in a little trouble, you know. Everybody we got him out. I was went better out than, it was better than getting behind the car and pulling like it was, my, was your idea. <laughs> <laughs> Schaffner runs right into the rush, and James King, he avoids the tackle, gets by the 50 near the 48-yard line. Ohio State has a lot of their second line people in on defense right now, but I'll tell you what they have in their mind. They want a shutout. I wouldn't mind seeing Minnesota get a touchdown just because I'd like to see an extra point. Tell them the last time they've had an extra point. I've never heard a stat like 41 this. 41 days ago is the last time Minnesota kicked an extra point. They have one for five this year. They have one extra point for 1991. I have never heard a stat like that before. Third and two. got the first down on third down and short and what makes the story even more interesting Michael Chalberg has kicked the one extra point and J.D. Carlson of Michigan has made 110 in a row and they had a little quote in the newspaper today that said if he continues his current pace and his eligibility does not run out and he's allowed to play forever he will break J.D. Carlson's record in the year 2100 <laughs> when they'll be playing back outdoors by then. There's Michael. Now, he's a true freshman, and he is on scholarship. Yeah. He was one of the best kickers in the country a year ago, but just a struggle. And what's amazing, point. he's the first kicker they've ever had scholarship on here. Schaffner over the head of Garrison. Tim Brando, what do you have for us? Fellas, the last time Nebraska lost in the Big 8 to someone other than Oklahoma and Colorado was 1978 when Warren Powers' Mizzou team beat them. And now they are tying Kansas at 17 on the basis of this Calvin Jones 47-yard run. I remember that game, a shocking victory as Warren Powers, a former Nebraska cornerback, led Mizzou that time in 1978. Schaffner here on second and 10. And they go to Carter. Outside has the first down and more. I think you 
you can see right there that Antonio Carter just needs a little bit of space to show that he has the ability to run the football. You know, you could put a lot of different guys. There you look at Stats right there, who's got the knee. And that's tough to look at right there. Joel Stat, a three-year starter, a true senior, academic All-Big Ten with a 3.8 grade point average, and now in his senior year is going to go out with it appears to be a knee injury. And uh, let's just hope that's not a very serious injury for a, a great football player. Carter's inside that 20-yard line. Well, granted, it is against the Ohio State second-team defense as Andy Gerd comes up to make this stop. Yeah, it is against the second-team Ohio State defense, but it's probably in talent matches up pretty evenly right here because Minnesota, obviously, with the plays, it's not play calling. It, it's just that they are just not strong enough man-to-man -to, -man to block this good defense by Ohio State. Ohio State runs their starters back in. They do not want to get up and touch down. the 10-yard line. A gain of eight, he now has 81 yards rushing, and that ties his season best that he had against Colorado earlier this year. This was a fourth down. This was an option play right here. I'm sorry, we're going to this isolation right here, the play that we just ran for a very good gain to, to the 10-yard line. Earlier in the game, when they had a fourth and nine situation, we kind of got on Minnesota for a bad call. We looked at the replay, and we want to show you really what the call was on that play when we get to it. Second down, two. King, the fullback, near a first down, pushed back. And 91, Jason Simmons, and Jason Simmons, the fellow who brought back that extra point block yeah. last week against Iowa. Yeah, that's a, you can score a touchdown and you end up, the other team ends up getting, a, it's only a four point turnaround because you get two and they get six. That really was a big difference in that game and tightened it up. Well, they will measure. There's a football near the eight yard line. And let's take a look at that play as we see it is just shy of a first down. Yeah, you remember earlier in the game that fourth down call right here? Look what it was supposed to be. It was fourth and nine, remember? It was going to be a throwback back to the quarterback. You see Fleetwood look back, but the pressure did not give him time to throw the ball back across the field. A well-conceived play, but not blocked, not executed well enough to give the fullback time to throw it back. Third and one inch. Schaffner will sneak it and get it. You know, Steve, I know you both of us are aware of this. We sit up here and we try to have fun with a game, and we, we understand that there's a lot of lives and families that have a livelihood about these football games, especially these great coaches in the Big Ten. And when you try to make points out of a, uh, out of a game, you, you don't want to make anybody look bad. You're just trying to have fun with a football game, and sometimes I really think we put too much importance on this end of the scoreboard type of a thing, and whether we should fire people. It gets to be ridiculous after. On first down. talking about John Gutekunst. His success, maybe just two wins this year with, with all the injuries, but he has had nine players, and this is a Minnesota record with academic all Big Ten standing. His players are graduating. He's a get-tough guy. Well, coming up on ESPN, we've got number 23 Georgia going against number six Florida. That's at 4 o'clock Eastern time here on ESPN. They show wishbone. Second and goal. Carter smashes. And look who gets it. A touchback, and the defense has done their job again as Marlon Kerner comes up with the loose ball. Timeout on the field. Nine minutes and 37 seconds remaining in this football game. And the Buckeyes leading the Golden Gophers of Minnesota 35 to 3. The 19th rated team in the nation, Ohio State, with a 35-3 lead on Minnesota. And Michael Chalberg, he still has to wait. Thought we were going to see him. Kick an extra point. 41 days. He was going to be the man. He was all psyched. He guaranteed he'd make him today. Seven for seven. And they fumble on a three-yard line. Curb Street. Pitches it out. Raymond Harris past the 30-yard line for a first down. Let's go to Tim Brando. 
Pittsburgh's going to win its sixth game and by virtue of that qualify for Bowles with a sixth Division 1A victory. Derek McCord would come into the game for Tom Tarver, sacked by Ricardo McDonald. Pitt wins it. They are 6-4, and four, but their lone remaining game is against Penn State. At 6-4, and four, the Bulls may stay away from them as a 6-5 team. Pitt gets the win. Ohio State marching towards their seventh try up at nine tries. Jeff Cochran, the fullback in the game. Raymond Harris, number 34, right behind him. And they'll run the option again and throw off it and almost complete the pass to Joey Galloway. Yeah, a good throw right there. Would have had Galloway down the sideline off option football right here. You see the option play right here. It's going to come down the line of scrimmage. Galloway suckers him as a block, and there he is down the sideline. Catches the football. It was just a little bit behind, or he would have been streaking for the first down. Again, I think that play is setting up Indiana and Michigan. They're going to have to practice it. Option to the short side. Remember the pass. Herb Street. Touch inside up near the 38-yard line. Now, Minnesota will fall today, and they'll go to 2-7 and seven on the year, but John Gutekunst has been a man, they say has been on the hot seat, but he has had injuries, he has been on probation, something that was not his doing when he was an assistant coach here. But he has had to fight out of this story after winning six games a year ago. Well, I mean, the Minnesota job is not going to be a job that you're going to come in and compete with Ohio State and Michigan yearly on a year-to-year -year basis. You're going to have a blip when you come up and go 9-2 and two or whatever, but basically you're going to try 6-5, and 7-4. and four. That's what they look for at Minnesota yearly. You don't have to win like a Michigan and Ohio State. All right, time out of the field, 8.29 to play in this football game, and Ohio State all over the Gophers, 35-3. Our CFA primetime game tonight at 7.30. It's number 15, Clemson, on the road, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. We'll have it to you live later tonight. Dante Lee with a nice inside move gets the first down up near the 48-yard line. Well, Michigan, the number four team in the team in the nation, went up against Northwestern earlier today, and in the third quarter, they are up 45 to 7. Now, Michigan is looking right towards Pasadena, and they may play either the third or second place team in the nation in Washington as the Huskies are the only unbeaten well, college football. I mean, against the consortium, that really could be the, the prime game on New Year's Day. There you see it, they've scored again 52 to 7. It's like doing a basketball score for Michigan this year. And uh, as Harris takes that one up in there, it really gives Michigan an opportunity, I believe, to win a national championship, bring a national championship back to the Big Ten for the first time since 1968. That's a long time for some major schools not to have been competing for a national championship. And unless they get upset, they will be playing Washington for a potential national championship spot. Do you like what the Bulls have done, the Orange Bowl, the Rose Bowl, the Fiesta Bowl, where they're trying to angle it, where they can have that national championship? I mean, the Fiesta already is promoting it as we have the uh, national championship with either Notre Dame against the winner of the state of Florida. Home Street downfield, and it is intercepted. Russ Heath. Personally, I don't. I, I, I think the college game can stand on its own. I don't think they have to go to the college-type format of, a, of, a, of a, the, in football where you have as many games. The only fair way to do a national championship is the way to do it in basketball, and because of the number of games, you can't do it. Again, they're still asking Herb Street to throw because he's proven he can run the option. If he gets into a football game, he has to have some experience throwing the ball against two tough foes coming up in Indiana and uh, Michigan the last game. And that should be a great game next week against Indiana. Nation's best running back and Vaughn Dunbar against the Big Ten's best defense. Yeah, I think uh, Ohio State maybe has improved more as a football team since the beginning of the season till now than any team in the Big Ten. Even Indiana? Oh, I believe so, but Indiana has the most improved football player, player in the Big Ten in Trent Green. He's really come along. He's playing qu uh, quarterback as well as anybody in the league, so that should be a good matchup for John Cooper to bring his football team back to Columbus and play a great uh, Bill Mallory coached football team. 
Wagner. He had his hands tied, John Cooper, when he came to Ohio State. And the Buckeyes will face Indiana in Columbus next Saturday. 25th rated Hoosiers and Ohio State next Saturday at 12.30 Eastern time. Followed by Arkansas and Texas A&M. And that should be a shootout because A&M, I understand, about two weeks ago was saying, hey, we are going to miss Arkansas leaving the SWC. 10.30. The WAC Conference Championship might be on the line in that game at BYU. They are 6-0 in league play. San Diego State is 5-1, depending on what they do today as they head towards next Saturday on ESPN. A second and four for Schaffner, and he throws to his tight end. That's a bootleg play, and they get the first down. Pat Evans. Yeah. That was a bootleg play that was a little bit of what they call a naked bootleg. The quarterback came out with no blocking, was able to get that ball off with someone right in his face. Pat Evans, not a bad day. Five catches for 62 yards. They just have been able to do nothing in the pocket. Everything has been on the bootleg in this football game so far for Minnesota. 29 catches now on the season. the 50 not much more though and let's go to Tim Brando you'll recall gentlemen we told you you have to have six division 1a victories to qualify for a bowl the defending co-national champion may not get that this year they're down to Furman 17 to 10 Georgia Tech has two remaining games against Wake Forest and against Georgia it would be a risk for a team to give them a bowl bid on November 16th with Georgia looming on the 30th yeah, absolutely I think Stanford is the other team that's at risk right now a very attractive team that doesn't have the six wins either Stanford right now five and three and they're playing UCLA this afternoon. So that'll be an interesting show as a penalty flag is down on the field near the line of scrimmage. But Stanford after losing the first three. Yeah. It jumped up and you know what? They've got the big game coming up late November against Cal and that is always interesting. It seems like the last three years Cal has been better but Stanford has beaten them or tied them. <laughs> One or the other, and Cal is shooting. Whatever way it ends, it won't end any better than the one end when they had the, the trombone player being run over. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the Cal win, and it seems like ever yeah. since then, Stanford said. Offside, on the defense, the penalty is declined. First Payback foul. will be a, a number of years. I don't know about you, but I'm watching this football game, and I'm looking up at the scoreboard. They have all the scores in the Big Ten up there occasionally on the board in here. And when you see 54 points, you, you keep wondering, how many does Desmond have? I, I think it's one. I mean, it, it, you wonder, like, he's got to have more than one. You know, now that he only has 20 touchdowns in the season, do you think that'll hurt his chances to win the Heisman? <laughs> <laughs> 52 points the seven for Northwestern and you and you, you say no Desmond's probably got four or five I mean the guy has been so incredible every time you look at a score you figure what he what did he do it's like what you know watching a, a home run hitter in baseball you just want can't wait to look for the box score Carter now has over 100 yards and that's the first time in 14 games excuse me that Minnesota has had a running back go over the century mark Second and two, Carter gets it again. He's got more than 100. Yeah, I think you're seeing right here what Carter can do if he's given room to run the football. I mean, he just took it into the secondary right there, and it looks like uh, I really can't get a picture on who it is. Is it Taylor, Walter Taylor, who's a, got a re injured wrist, it appears. He took Carter on. Carter was running full speed, and it looked like he was holding his shoulder. Has his right shoulder right there. Well, he's the one who tried to stick his nose in there and bring down big Antonio Carter, who's having a special day against his old city. Went, grew up in Columbus High, Columbus area, went to Columbus South High School. There you can see it right here. He's into the secondary, and boy, the first thing that touches a guy running right at you full speed is your right shoulder. And for Taylor, that's the way you get hurt. You have to deliver the ball, the blow. You can't stand back there and catch. That's what I was good at. When I played secondary in high school, <laughs> you be one of those tackles where you got your eyes closed, you know? Guy runs right over leaning you. Leaning backwards. Just leaning backwards. <laughs> you used to tape your shoes so you'd say, hey, coach, I slipped. Put the, you know, it's bad when you have to have your numbers on the bottom of your shoes. But on defense, that's where the easiest way to read them. Well, we have five minutes and ten seconds to play here as Walter Taylor trying to get up a very talented cornerback was a big part of their secondary future. Although they go with four underclassmen in the starting cornerback spots. We saw Brian Cook go down earlier today, but Tim Walton, another sophomore, replaced him and even intercepted a pass. 
So Taylor will leave. Tito Paul for nine comes on for him. Well, I got my answer. Desmond has four receptions, over 100 yards in receiving, but he only has one touch on him. Ooh, that could hurt. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Antonio Carter diving forward near the 23-yard line. Well, what do you think here now? Well, let's let, let's start talking about this uh, Ohio State Indiana game next week. How do you how do you feel that game's going to break? I know you really like Indiana. I like everything Bill Mallory has done with the staff. He's changed defenses. He's changed offenses with that one-back look. And Trent Green, the improvement he has made. It seems like Green has come up with so many big plays to give his team the edge this year. I think it's going to go in even. Buckeyes will probably be favored because he's a ball and a shot there. Goes inside the 15-yard line and picks up the first down. We've got the thrifty Holiday Bowl coming up on ESPN. And here's a look at the conference standings. We told you about our showcase coming up next week on ESPN. Brigham Young against San Diego State. You see San Diego State just a game behind. Wyoming is at 2-4-1. And, and New Mexico 1-5 and 2-8. and, two and eight. Holiday Bowl on ESPN. Yeah. 8 o'clock Eastern time. Carter leans forward on a first down play and gets near the 10 yard line. Well, Minnesota knew going into this football game that they were going to have to play a perfect football game to stay with Ohio State. At least that's what they told us. I don't think they could even have played a perfect football game and beat Ohio State today. Had they not turned it over, I just think this Ohio State defense is just too powerful. There's really nothing they can do. You turn around, and they've got outside rush people. They've got a good hard-hitting secondary. And Minnesota just does not have enough offense. Greg Smith seems that's who he was limping off right there. They can't lose him against yeah. Indiana next week. And, and apparently, it looks like the right ankle right there. And you're right. They need him because Indiana with Vaughn Dunbar, you've got to take away the inside of that formation because that's really the strength of the Indiana football team. They can hit you both with the run and the pass. Second down and eight for Scott Schaffner in for placing the injured Markel Fleetwood. Here's play action. And Schaffner on lows and is almost picked off. Andy Gerd is slipping over the middle. Now Schaffner just made the basic same mistake that Fleetwood did, throwing the ball over the middle without accounting for your secondary people. Threw the ball late over the middle, and there were two or three guys that could have intercepted that pass. Gerd one, Tom Lease number 81 another. You know, Bill Young, the defensive coordinator for Ohio State, got burnt last week on that blitz against Iowa with that long touchdown pass on, a, on an audible play. They have not blitzed at all against this Minnesota team. They have not shown it. Mostly zone coverage laying back. If they bring anybody, one linebacker. Shockley. Here comes the pressure. Dumps it off. Carter inside the 10. Cuts back. No. It'll be a fourth down. team out right now and obviously for what people we still have here in the stadium they're not extremely excited about that 26 yard field goal attempt by Michael Schalberg and he is a fellow that Bud Grant's son coaches at Forest Lake High School and he said he was the best kicker he ever saw high school All-American last year 26 he has it up and he will have it through it is 35 to 6 the Buckeyes lead has been tripped to 29 with 240 to play. Right around the corner of college football as the Buckeyes are up on Minnesota 35 to 6 we have basketball coming your way and over 200 games on ESPN and to tip it off Friday night Indiana faces UCLA in the Hall of Fame tip off classic. It's really terrific stuff. It all starts at 9 Eastern time live on ESPN. Guy on your right is Don McLean and Calvert Cheney on the left. And they are two stellar stars and UCLA program is going to get a fellow back inside who was a high school All-American and tore up his knee last year. He want him back right now. Well, if I was.
Bruins going to handicap that Indiana Ohio State game next next UCLA. week? UCLA. Yeah. Indiana UCLA. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you're talking Indiana about the football Ohio. game. I, I was in the hoops up, already. I've, I've got a one track mind over here. But if I was going to handicap that game, I would think that weather is going to play a key role. Indiana knee is going to need to throw that football around the field and keep this defense by Ohio State spread. I mean, we heard Hayden Fry. He went into that game. He didn't think he could run the ball against Ohio State. He was right. They threw often, they threw short, and they moved the chains. And I think that's what Indiana will try to do is move the chains with their passing game. And they will need a healthy Carlos Snow who lets the ball go through the end zone. Snow has had near 100-yard effort today. Coming up after our game, we've got the college football scoreboard show. Brando, Lee Corso, as they take a look at all the scores from around the nation, including number one Florida State. And we know we have a good Big Ten audience, so they'll be showing highlights of that Michigan game as well. Desmond Howard with over 100 yards receiving and another touchdown, his 20th this year. Herb Street remains the quarterback as they have not gone with the redshirt freshman Joe Pickett. Harris the backs. And they try the middle of Jeff Kaufman. He's out past the 25 yard line. There's Joe Pickens talking with his quarterback coach upstairs. I think his quarterback coach is getting hot dogs and is on his way down to the locker room right now. There's not much you can talk about when you're ahead 35 to 6. There's the quarterback hey. coach. He's knitting us out there, <laughs> calling plays. To be a to be a Gopher fan right now, you have to come prepared. Used to be you had to wear your dress warmly. Now you got to bring knitting. <laughs> oh, Raymond Harris to the outside and gets to midfield. You know, it, I don't know. You can see her from here. She's in the top row of the stands, too. That, that's what really was funny about that shot right there. And, you know, she well, the problem is she's standing in the area where there's no knitting. <laughs> they have no smoking sections. Well, this was the city where that sign first became popular, the no smoking sign, and now they're trying to make popular the no knitting sign. <laughs> Sixty-eight yards total offense by Ohio State, and Raymond Harris is inside the 35-yard line. Well, Raymond Harris goes 222 pounds also, and you can see these backs that they have. You know, for both teams, Carter's shown it, and Raymond Harris has shown it. Snow, and if they've got room to run, a lot of guys look good carrying the ball. A lot of guys' high school films look good until they get into the Big Ten and they got nowhere to run. He's averaging 11 yards per carry. Minute 36 to play. Ohio State looking toward another bowl game at the end of this year. And we have a time out on the field with a minute 29 to play. The Buckeyes are pounding the Minnesota Golden Gophers 35 to 6. Mike Dooley, back of Lyman. Yeah, it's good to see John Cooper smiling. Absolutely. You know, he's had a, a tough year this year. It all started with the Robert Smith situation, you know, and we, we asked him about it on the sideline, and he says, you know, I don't know what the measurement is to, to be a good coach at Ohio State. I know you got to win. I believe we can win every game in the remaining of our schedule. I know Michigan's a good football team, and I have my best football team I'm looking forward to playing. Thumbs up for Ohio State today. Herb Street, which is to Harris, a short gain. And we will be under a minute to go when the next play comes off. You know, the, the demands of a college coach have changed, and, and a lot of people in college football who have been around the powers like Michigan, Ohio State, UCLA, USC, Texas, when they cut back from 130 scholarships to 90, it really even now the college ranks. Well, I mean, was, you still have the power. Right, it was supposed to, but it does seem like it's the same guys all the time. Sure. It's up there in that top 20, you know, so uh, it has, I think it's made the injury situation more magnified, but the, the, the marquee schools still have a tough time having a real bad season. But even in the Big Ten Conference, Michigan and Ohio State and Iowa are now joined by Indiana and Illinois. There you go. That's good. You throw out the gun with the same hand that you shake cans with the rest of the way. You get in there and you get ready and a good victory for Ohio State. And we're going to have a great football game next week. Raymond Harris 
Rose to the outside. He'll stay in bounds, and the clock winds out as Ohio State wins their seventh of the year. John Cooper is team seven and two. And Minnesota falls to two and seven. Our college football scoreboard show is coming up next, followed by Georgia and Florida at four o'clock. For Gary Danielson, I'm Steve Fiziak. The Buckeyes of Mr. John Cooper beat Minnesota 35 to 6. Good night, everyone. Ford Taurus.